G'day and welcome to Pints with Aquinas. Lovely to have you with us. Today I'll be interviewing Michael Knowles from the Michael Knowles Show. Maybe you've heard of it. But before we get to that interview, I want to invite you to follow us over on Locals, mattfrad.locals.com. Locals is like other social media, but it's actually social. It's excellent. It's non-sensorial. I'm not going to get banned there the way I might on YouTube after this interview. So please go follow us over there. You don't have to support financially to follow us, but I'm doing a giveaway uh, this week. If you become an annual supporter at mattfrad.locals.com right now, for any amount, the first 100 of you will receive a free rosary from Catholic Woodworker. If you live in the United States, we'll even pay shipping. But if you live abroad, we'd ask that you pay for that shipping if you're one of those first 100. Now, we may not even get 100 of you signing up. So we're going to give it a week. So it's not just today, but it's for the next week. The first 100 of you that become annual supporters over at mattfrad.locals.com will get a free rosary. And when you do support us on Locals, you get a bunch of free things in return, like monthly exclusive spiritual direction videos from Father Gregory Pine, or my quarterly newspaper, which I send out and don't even pay you, you don't have to pay for shipping, even if you live in Australia or Yemen or wherever. What else do we do? We have awesome courses from like Dr. Fazer on the five ways and others, and these are all exclusively uh, for our local supporters. Oh, also, right after today's interview with Michael Knowles, I'm going to be doing a bonus segment where we discuss three things that would probably get us banned from YouTube. Uh, so that will only be available to local supporters after today's interview, mattfrad.locals.com. Halfway through a sentence, go. <laughs> So you wrote the book, which, congratulations. Oh, you, thank you. You need to do a book where you just have the Amazon reviews, because yeah. those are the funniest things about the book. <laughs> it, was, it was a very, very, uh, very odd way to get a career writing and speaking, to publish a book. How did book. the idea come to you? I, well, you know, just a stroke of genius. <laughs> I will say it's been done before. Okay. So there's a book called Everything Men Know About Women. Ah. It sold a million copies, I think. More than I've sold. Uh, the Wit and Wisdom of the German People, that was another one. Uh, it actually goes back to 1880 okay. in the United States. There was a, a five-page blank book published by James Garfield and Chester Arthur, which was the Republican ticket, which was called The Political Achievements and Statesmanship of, I forget the guy's name, General Hancock or something. It was the Democrat nominee. Five blank pages. So it, it's got a long tradition in the United States. Uh, but as a result of this, I get a show and I get this speaking career and I, and I come to Franciscan of Steubenville and I, th I thought, wow, this is so totally different from my college experience uh, because my college experience, uh, not to tell tales out of school, but everything seemed to be oriented toward uh, confusion and vice and falsehood. Mm. You know? And here at Franciscan, it's like sort of the yeah, opposite. The peer so, pressure is to be holy. That's right. Yeah. yeah. yeah like, I, rem I, was, I was going around with some of the kids who invited me. Yeah. I said, so what do you guys do for fun here? I said, well, you know, we have chapels in our dorms. I said, well, <laughs> come again. Yeah, it's a great school. Now, Matt, how your talk, honestly, your talk was excellent last night. I said this to you before you came in. I was. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I was really, I was really edified by it. It was really good. I appreciate it. I, I never know with these speeches uh, how they're going to be received because I, I try to write a new speech for every event, and most people don't because it's a big hassle, and mm -hmm. so they give a kind of a stump speech. But I just feel the speech is being live streamed, so I don't want the audience to get bored, and yeah. I don't want to get bored giving the same thing, and I like to take it as an opportunity. But I, I didn't know how it would be received, because the thesis of the speech is that science is fake. Yes, and that's the name of the title. If you want to look up the video, Neil, maybe you could put a link in the description. It's called Science is Fake. <laughs> great, great title. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, but I was thinking, you know, it's, it's a little bit of a clickbaity title, though that is the thesis of the speech. But then uh, the meat of the speech is kind of going through all of these sort of scientific and mathematical problems and theories and, and really getting more into Owen Barfield and uh, his understanding of representation and symbolism and idolatry. And we're sitting here in the Chesterton Cigar Lounge, so the inkling Owen Barfield would fit right in. Mm -hmm. But But I... I had a fear with the speech, which is the title is total, you know, lowest common denominator clickbait. Mm -hmm. But then the speech itself is a little um, esoteric. It is, yeah. And so I, I, I didn't know. I thought I might, I might have completely screwed myself on both sides here. You I know, see, and yeah. No one's going to watch it or like it. Now, is this a talk you say you write it um, every year? When you, did you do a kind of speaking circuit with 
Uh, yeah. Yaf, is it? Yaf, yeah. 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 So I do... It, it really varies, especially because of COVID. During COVID, I had something like 20 schools uh, that were scheduled for the year. And then after number two, that diminutive uh, technocrat from Brooklyn shut the world down. And so th they all were canceled. Uh, mm. And uh, so it, that would have been too much. And it gave me an opportunity to write a book with words. And it, I was having a child. And it was, it was actually uh, helpful in a certain way. Now I try to keep it to about six or seven schools per semester. Yeah. Uh, but if you write a new speech every time, but is the speech for every tour, or is it for every different school? You no, it's for speech? every school, okay. basically. I mean, occasionally I'll use parts Bits, of yeah. yeah, but no, I, I just sort of feel if I'm going to do it, if I'm going to get on an airplane and fly somewhere, and yeah. I, I want to say something, you know, yeah. I don't want it to just be a sort of pep rally or D did you hear that crazy thing AOC said or whatever. Yeah. Uh, and, and also, part of it is because the the speech is are for the people in the room, but let's say there's 500 people in the room or whatever it is, you know, maybe even a thousand people in the room, but online you're going to get tens of thousands of people and they're the ones who have seen all the other talks. Mm -hmm. So just from self-preservation, if you give them the same thing every time, yes. no one's going to watch it anymore. You know? I was telling you before we recorded that you have security at your talks and I want to ask you what that's like. And halfway through the talk, my wife suggested that I run up and hug that dude with the mustache to see if he would tase me or what would happen. His bark is much worse than his what bite. What would have happened though if I had have gotten up and tried to hug him? He would have killed you. Yes. Yeah. So the bite is bad too. I'm not, but the, but the bark is just especially bad. Especially. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So when did you start traveling with security and what was that like? What is that? Well, I love our security agents. So it's a great pleasure to do it. And we go out and have cigars and have a great time. But I, I think it's mostly unnecessary uh, because it looks cool though it look yeah it looks it looks very cool <laughs> it looks much more important than i am and uh, but i think it's mostly unnecessary because matt i'm so lovable who would want to attack I me i don't know right? who would yeah. and, and the other the other reason it's unnecessary in certain places is we're at franciscan university the, the biggest threat that the I'm going to have is The biggest threat is probably the, single girls who are going to want to hold you <laughs> and not let go. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, I was assuming it'd be some sort of stray <laughs> Jesuit, you know, uh, who yeah, well gets in there too, and yeah. starts to attack me or something. But I, I was attacked once at a speech. This is when it all started. Yeah. I was giving a speech at the University of Missouri, Kansas City. This was years ago, and the speech was called Men Are Not Women. I'm going to sue Matt Walsh for copyright infringement, <laughs> Good, yes. intellectual property theft. Uh, but this was probably five years ago or so. And th there was an organized protest. The kids were very raucous. Uh, but I had, because I had written my speech down, it didn't matter. They were screaming like banshees in the yeah. room, which you can't really hear on the tape. But I could just read the speech. At a certain point, they gave up and went out. But someone tripped a fire door mm. and... I guess they had planned some stunt. And a guy comes in with a super soaker filled with... Who knows what? Yeah, it's, do you say? I remember this now. It smelled like bleach or so something. So in, in the room, the, the people organizing the event thought it was bleach. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the cops, came, obviously cops were involved. I, I don't think it ended up being bleach. Mm -hmm. it, it, it did smell like bleach. Then there were rumors that there were all sorts of fluids in it that no one wants to think sure. about. Uh, you know, it was, yeah. Yeah, it was not, not a cocktail that one would uh, enjoy. No. But uh, as a result of that... Now we, we travel with security everywhere. Is that like a daily wire kind of mandate for all speakers when they yeah. go out? Yeah. yeah, it's a total mandate. And so but it can be somewhat embarrassing, though, because I, I for almost three years, I hosted a podcast with Ted Cruz. Mm. And Ted Cruz is a, this is a very serious guy, prominent yeah. senator, presidential candidate. And one time, <laughs> he and I were at an event, and uh, the senator's deputy chief of staff turns to me and goes, Michael, is that your detail? You know, is this <laughs> army of special operators. And I said, uh, yeah, yeah. He said, why do you have a bigger detail than the senator who gets the real threats? You know, and I thought that's. But but uh, Daily Wire takes it very seriously, which I guess is good. If I'm yeah. gonna if I'm gonna get popped off, you know, I I uh, I, I want to make sure that it's uh, not frivolous. You know, I want it to be a real political yes, attack. Yeah. Go out in flames. <laughs> yeah. So I, I would imagine all of this um, kind of excitement and protest surrounding your events, and you as an individual is really good for business, right? <laughs> I, I think it was um, yeah. I th Shapiro quoted uh, somebody who's saying, uh, whatever doesn't kill you makes you more famous. That's right. <laughs> um, That's right. So what's it like having to live that life and 
you know, it's kind of like the scandal surrounding you right, brings you to the surface again as far as clicks and popularity. And Well, so there, there's a lot of truth to that. If people go out and have a big protest, it obviously calls more attention to your events. So, you know, when that's happened, those are the speeches that get, get viewed the most. But you've got to be really careful not to chase that. Because if you chase that, then really you just become a performance artist. And I don't think that's particularly good for the soul. And I don't think it's good for your career in the long run. I mean, okay. then you've... I, and I, I won't name names. In years past, so there have been plenty of people on the left and the right who, who have done that. And they, they really sort of flame out. And yeah, I, that's what I was going to say. That must be exhausting. To it's got to live you know, that up, keep that up. Yeah. yeah. And, and also then you're just you're so tempted to do and say things that you might not even believe just to get a reaction. Yeah. And so I, I consider myself one of the least own the libsy okay. kind of conservatives out there. It's kind of funny because I did this joke book that yeah. was just 100% owning the <laughs> libs. libs. But, but I, I try n not to do that. I mean, I probably spend half my time or more criticizing the conservatives mm. for being incoherent and cowardly. Uh, that then I spent making fun of AOC or something like that. Uh, basic fundamental question. Yep. What is conservatism? Hmm. Roger Scruton said him. in his just beautifully Roger Scruton-y way, I don't have the accent, so I can't really do it. He said, oh, you know, you would imagine that a conservative wants to conserve things. And that's... A large part of my answer, the, the answer that you're supposed to give in the American conservative movement context is, you know, you push your glasses up on your nose and you say, well, uh, actually, uh, to be a conservative is to, you, you want to reduce the size and scope of the government, you want to cut taxes, and you want to let people do whatever they want to do. And that's what, uh, you know, that's just silly. I mean, that, that's libertarianism, mm. which did come to dominate the conservative movement for much of the last half of the 20th century. Uh, and the results have been a, a disaster. So I don't think that's what conservatism is. I think we want to conserve things. We want to conserve the good and the true and the beautiful. We do want to conserve our traditions. We want to conserve our way of life. We want to conserve our families and our communities. Mm -hmm. We want to conserve our very identity. You know, I think half of my family is of the swarthy Sicilian persuasion. And so food is very important to our culture. Right. Food is a big part of the Italian-American identity. When Klaus Schwab comes in and says, you, you are going to eat the bugs, you are not going to eat the cannoli anymore, you will eat the bugs, that is an attack not just on gastronomy. or on, <laughs> on, It's an attack on identity. And there are so many other facets of our identity, our sexual identity, our national identity, our, mm. and then ultimately, of course, our religious identity. I mean, that's... If, if, we will ground our identity either in I am who I am or we will be left with the pathetic question, which is who am I? Like a mm. teenager trying on different personalities. Yeah. That's a, an observation from my friend, uh, Father George Rutler. And, and mm. so that's where your, your identity ultimately uh, has to be. Mm -hmm. And you're, you're seeing a concerted attack on that in particular. I mean, we're speaking now hours after the passage of this preposterous bill to redefine marriage. And we, we knew it was going to pass because 12 Republican senators squished on it. Mm. And uh, they allowed it to get past the filibuster, which mean, meant that the Democrats needed a bare majority, not 60 votes. So at the very last moment, Mike Lee, Marco Rubio, I think Lankford, there, there were a few senators who tried to throw some amendments in the bill to not have this thing completely destroy Christian mm. business owners and, and, and Jews and Muslims and, pe and ordinary sensible atheists who mm -hmm. recognize what marriage is and the amendments were all shot down and so the amendments were shot down by the democrats yeah they were shot down by the liberals yeah they were shot down by the republicans though you know we're just always one or two votes short aren't we there's always that mitt romney out there there's always that squish who is going to come out and prevent you from having any kind of Victory, and I think with Republican senators like that, who needs Democrats? If if that's what conservatives are doing, then truly they're not conserving a damn thing because marriage is the fundamental political institution. Yeah. If you can't conserve that, you simply are not a conservative. So, 
as it feels like the left has been dragging us in th their direction such that people like Joe Rogan are thought of to be conservative or even Dave Rubin. So, you know, you talked about conserving what's true, good and beautiful, which is quite general. You talked about marriage, which is specific. Yeah. But I suppose what's something that Catholic Christians should want to conserve that would upset people who are thought to be conservative like Joe Rogan or Dave Rubin? Well, uh, <laughs> to use those examples, uh, and, and Dave in particular, probably marriage would be a good mm -hmm. example of this. Though, I tell you, I know Dave and Joe Rogan and even other people who are center left who now are viewed as on the right, people like Elon Musk and others, mm -hmm. uh, they catch a lot of flack because they hold plenty of liberal views and they, some of their uh, political vision is, is a little inconsistent or incoherent. But uh, I'll take it, you know, I'll t I mean, I, I'm, uh, friends with Dave Rubin. I don't know Joe yeah. personally. I don't know Elon Musk. But Dave has good inclinations, mm -hmm. meaning he recognized, he was a big lib. He recognized something was seriously wrong. Dave has become much more conservative every year that I've known him, and I've mm -hmm. only known him six, seven years now. And uh, so, yes, obviously there are still plenty of, I think, inconsistencies with his view. It'd be hard to call Dave a conservative, mm. really. But when you look at this insane culture that we're living in, where we are being inundated constantly with confusion, inanity, false history, absolutely incoherent uh, epistemology, ontology, I, you know, yeah. and, and, and on top of that, all this insane sex stuff, I can't really blame people hmm. for falling into it, yeah. you know? And, and, I, and I wonder what's the way out that we're going to yeah. give people. I, obviously there's the marriage problem, but take it even to its logical extreme, the transgender issue. What do you say to some poor girl who at age 16 was told, chop your breasts off, pump yourself full of poison, destroy your voice, have your hair all fall out, just mutilate your body, become sterile, and then she figures out six years later, yeah. I've made a horrible mistake. Bless her. What do we do for those people? What, yeah. do, what do we do even on the marriage question? What do we do for a couple of guys who have indulged same-sex attraction mm -hmm. and who, who have taken on a gay identity and who, who have even gotten gay married, and then a couple of years later they wake up and say, wait a second, this isn't what marriage is. Yeah. What do we do? What is yes. the, the off-ramp? I love that. Yeah. It's a great question because we're all victims of the sexual revolution, yeah. even if it's just we've been inundated by porn since the time we were kids. and. Right that's affected us it's affected our relationships and so how do we i love that what's the off ramp it reminds me of a line of from peter kraft who said when a maniac is at the door feuding brothers reconcile <laughs> and so i understand there is this desire to get really clear about what it is we believe and what it is we'd like to see happen in american society what we might like to see outlawed etc but i think it is important that we we uh, uh we find comrades wherever we can find them you know allies yeah. of course because the, the maniac at the door is a really apt analogy, especially because maniacs and lunatics are incoherent, right? They, there is a, a huge gap between what they view reality to be and, and uh, reality itself. And this is a problem for our culture because we're all kind of maniacs. This, this was the real point of my speech last night at Franciscan, which is... We, we've had a total breakdown in representations. And Owen Barfield, this uh, philosopher uh, who is an inkling, who I played a large role in converting C.S. Lewis, and who's underappreciated, but he, he predicted all of this in 1965. He said, as the scientific revolution uh, m moves forward, what you're going to see is mm. a d diminishing of original participation in reality. You're going to see an increase in the uh, gap between the symbol and the symbolized. And you're going to see a kind of idolatry of phenomena, idolatry of matter, because science only looks at the physical world. And, and so you, obviously we see this in the way that we talk about sex, right? Sex is, um, no we no longer talk about making love. We no longer talk about sex really in the context of marriage. Sex is just what some piece of flesh does to another piece of flesh yeah, yeah. to titillate oneself. Yeah. And, uh, or even you mentioned porn, you know, we ab abstract that even further. Sex is the thing that we see on the pixels on the screen. And, and then we do something with ourselves, you know, in mm -hmm. a dark corner of, of our apartment. Uh, th that, that creates an, an idol. And what Barfield predicted was this would break down 
collective representations such that there is no unity of of pictures anymore we actually mm. don't know what a woman is we actually don't people actually don't know what marriage is and so people will each be speaking their own language yeah. of, of Babel and that that's what's gone on so yeah obviously <laughs> it's sort of like other than that mrs. Lincoln how'd you like the play we all know that the conservative movement is in really bad shape it's in so much worse shape <laughs> than anybody thinks it is because we can't even agree on what the, the fundamental components of reality mean anymore. Yeah. It seems like there's less infighting among the left and the agenda they're trying to push than yeah. there is among conservatives. Is that because it's a lot easier to tear something down than to rebuild something? Or? Of course, yeah. That, that's a big part of it. But it, it's also because... Because the left has replaced our representations, our images, our, our understanding of what reality means, because it has replaced those things so effectively, they're all kind of on the same page. Mm. We are the ones who are not because half of the conserv more than half of the conservatives now, the majority of Republicans believe that marriage is any union of two people who like each other. Mm -hmm. Right? This is radical. This is radically to the left of Barack Obama in 2011. Yeah. So w when you're in, in that place, the, the libs have n not only deluded themselves, they've deluded half of us as well. Hmm. Yeah, man. Um, what I, you said something last night that I thought was really interesting, and that's that, yeah, le leftists get it wrong when they're asked what a woman is, but that conservatives don't get it much better. You want to talk right. about that? Yeah. I mean, this is exactly on this problem that we're talking about. Of, we've 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 taken their premises without even knowing it. Hmm. Uh, I, I call it the dead end of DNA. The, the leftist answer to what is a woman is, well, I don't know. I'm not a biologist. I'm not a scientist. It's very very complicated. Women are so much more than just yeah. some genitals and chromosomes. But the the conservative answer now is women are just genitals and chromosomes. Yeah. That's the same soul-denying scientism that the libs have been peddling to get us into this mess in the first place. I don't think that women are just a couple of X chromosomes. Yeah. I have a family member who has Turner syndrome. Turner okay. syndrome is where you've, you're a woman, but you've yeah. only got one X chromosome. She's not a woman? No, mm -hmm. she's obviously a woman. Uh, I, I know women who have had hysterectomies. They don't have a womb. Not a woman? No, of course. That's, what, what, is, what is a woman? Uh, my friend Matt Walsh did this documentary, What is a Woman, that uh, did very, very well and kind of poked fun at all these libs. The most interesting part of the movie that a lot of people didn't pick up on is that a lot of glib conservatives are saying, oh, it's just, you know, breasts and a womb. That's what a woman is. But he goes to the Maasai people in Africa. Yeah. And he says, what is a woman? And the, Ma the Maasai people said a woman is someone who does the duty of a woman. Mm. Right. The, the conservative line on transgenderism so far has been there is no distinction between sex and gender. We get transgenderism because the libs tell us there's biological sex and there's gender, which is a social construct, and you can have the ma male gender but female sex, and there mm -hmm. you have it. And the conservative answer has been to deny that and say, no, it's all just physical. But that's not true. There's obviously gender expression. You can have an effeminate man. You can have a butch woman. Mm -hmm. I've got, there have been tomboys for all of history. And a lot of that is socially constructed. The conservative answer, I think, is there is a distinction between sex and gender. And you have a duty <laughs> to perform your gender in accordance with your sex. You have an obligation to fulfill the natural roles that, go, that correspond with your sex because man is not this uh, just dualistic being where your soul and which is when they talk about gender they're really just talking about the soul they just don't want to admit it uh, where your soul and your body have nothing to do with one yeah. another no we, we're hylomorphic beings and our souls and our bodies are intrinsically uh, united here on earth and uh, so w we have an obligation to do those things this would have been commonly understood everyone would have agreed with this 20 30 years ago. Now, even many conservatives, if you say that, if you, if you give them the Don Corleone answer, and you say, you're a man, what can you do? 
You can act like a man. What's the matter with you? You tell a woman, what are you going to You act like a woman. Mm -hmm. They will back away from you. They'll say, oh my goodness, you knuckle dragger, you authoritarian. Oh my, you sound like a fascist. I don't sound like a fascist. I sound like everybody in the 90s. How is that then not just a criticism of tomboys? Because it sounds like what you're saying is a, a girl who's a tomboy needs to stop that or needs to grow into her womanhood and begin to act like a woman. Where's the diversity? Where's, where, where's the allowance for diversity among men and women then? No, you, uh, well, it is basically what I'm saying. Is that, yeah, if you're, a, if you're a man and you're feeling a little, uh, you know, you, you want to uh, put on a dress, don't. Yeah. You're a woman who wants to perform your life as a man. What does that look don't. like though? That's what I'm trying to get to. What's like, well, the dress thing makes like tra sense Trousers me. on men and dresses on women, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like, no, is that where you would draw the line then? I'm trying to get you. No, there. I think women should be allowed to wear pants on occasion. Okay. You know, I'm not, I'm not going that far. But, and of course there is diversity and, and this is a, you know, an eccentric world and, and uh, that mm -hmm. adds a lot of spice to life. Yeah. But we need to recognize what the center of life is. Mm -hmm. A good, a good uh, image of this was put forward by uh, Jonathan Peugeot, mm -hmm. the uh, iconographer in Canada, who uh, he, he said, we, we've always understood in our civilization that there's weird stuff and that's kind of nice it adds spice to life yeah the weird stuff though <laughs> needs go, to stay <laughs> it needs to well yes you look at a medieval manuscript there's yeah. weird stuff i mean there's all sorts of like you know little elves with weird things coming out of their yes, bodies yes, yes, yes. you know riding on top of snakes and stuff but it's always on the edges Peripheries, of the yeah, it's always yeah. on the periphery you go to a beautiful cathedral the gargoyles are yeah. on the top you know and all these kind of interesting <laughs> weird designs it's not all gargoyles. It's yeah, not, I was it's, just in the Vatican last week. That would have been really weird. Would have ruined the church. It would have ruined. And actually, with some of the architecture, Modern churches have done just that. They yes. have done that. When you put the gargoyle into the center of the church, something has gone dramatically wrong. And so, what what the libs have been doing is they have not been, as the conservatives pretend, you know, simply censoring our speech. You know, and we're the defenders of free speech, and they're the defenders of censorship. Yeah. Uh, what the libs are really engaging in is an upending of norms and standards and taboos. And uh, mm. the, the, the libs are actually the ones who tricked us into adopting the free speech absolutist position. It happened in the middle of the 20th century when the libs launched the free speech movement at Berkeley. And uh, the, uh, people look at Berkeley now. They say, well, how did Berkeley, which is the center of the free speech movement, how did it become so uh, absolutely full of censorship against conservatives? Because the free speech movement was never about free speech. There's no such thing as total free speech. There's no such thing as absolute uh, neutrality in the public square or anything like that. It's never been true in any political community. Uh, communities naturally have taboos, mm -hmm. standards. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, political correctness is a code of speech. So is chivalry, okay? I'm not, and I'm all for chivalry. Uh, so what, what the libs have done is invert those norms and standards and what the the conservatives have done is abandon them. Can you imagine that? To, that conservatives are now the ones who say, oh yes, we need uh, social media networks where you can say anything, do anything, post all manner of obscenity and threats. Yeah, and yeah. All. No, of course, that's insane. No, what we need is to promote good, reasonable standards and to suppress unreasonable, ugly, evil, wicked, false things. Mm -hmm. We talked a moment ago about being victims of the sexual revolution and needing an off-ramp. And that's true of people perhaps who are living in sort of sodomitic relationships or who have had their bodies mutilated. But it's also true for those of us who have just imbibed the quote-unquote values of the sexual revolution. How did you and your wife make the choice, or did you, to begin to you to live live more masculinely, as it were, and her to live more uh, as a woman. Like you know what I mean? Over time is really how it happened because I, I met my wife. We don't remember meeting, but we <laughs> we met in fifth grade oh, wow. at district orchestra. She was from Bedford Village. That was the nice side of the tracks. I was from the the wrong side of the tracks, Bedford Hills uh -huh. in New York, right near AOC actually, okay. and. Uh, but we, we met, I guess, in fifth grade. We were in the homeroom together in sixth grade, started dating in high school. Uh, I think it's now a federal statutory requirement. You have to split for college if you're a millennial. So we broke up for college, unfortunately. Got back together after college. I was an atheist, uh, hmm. or certainly agnostic, really atheist for like 10 years. Okay. Uh, my wife was raised without any kind of real religious rigor at all. And 
so this is why I have such sympathy for people who are looking around the world and they're, they are kind of grappling towards the truth, even though they don't know quite how to make sense of it, because that was me too. And uh, now, obviously, we're quite, quite traditional. Mm-hmm. And we, we look back and we say, everything that everyone told us was wrong. Oh my goodness, everything that we were told by our mm. <laughs> teachers and by our community, and by, mm-hmm. it was all just completely, completely insane. And uh, it, it's that great description that, uh, that Ernest Hemingway has of bankruptcy, right? Things happen gradually, then suddenly. Mm. You sort of go around for 10 years saying, huh, does God exist? Is there such a thing as objective truth? Should I maybe be doing good things and avoiding bad things? And then, you know, then pretty soon you say, Oh, yes, I should. We also need to go to Latin Mass uh, frequently. <laughs> we also need to go to Confession Weekly. We also Burn you know, your pants. That's yeah. right, yeah. yeah. Okay. So was it something of a conversion for both of you around the same time? Were you both? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I reverted to the... I was cradle Catholic, but by 13, by my confirmation, I, I was convinced God didn't exist and it was all hooey. And I... Uh, were you sucked into the new atheist movement? Oh, of course. You were, yeah. I'm ashamed. Why, Matt, would you force me to admit that on air? <laughs> I was. I was sucked yeah. in by the clever little barbs of Christopher Hitchens. Oh, he was the, so well-spoken. He was so, well so spoken. enjoyable to I know. listen to. I saw him have a debate with uh, Rabbi Shmuley Boteic at the 92nd Y on the existence of God. Yeah. And Shmuley Boteic was obviously right on the question, but Hitchens won the debate because he was just so clever. I tell you, the only time I think that didn't happen that I've seen is when he debated William Lane Craig. Mm. I was shocked. I remember being afraid to watch that debate because I just couldn't stand to see another Christian be decimated by an atheist. But when I watched it, I thought, oh my goodness, Hitchens had nothing. And I thought that Craig matched him in charm and wit. I thought he was excellent. And and if you go back now and you look at the... uh, new atheists who really were more of a publishing phenomenon than they were an intellectual movement. Uh, There's just like a few books that were all extremely glib. But if you go back now and, and watch their arguments, I, pretty weak they stuff. Are absolutely terrible. But I was 13 when they came up. I and see. It was tailor-made. How old are you a, now? I am 32. I'm an old man. Oh, yeah. I'm 39. But, 39. So I, I had come to Christ when I, he had came to me perhaps when I was 17. Hmm. The year 2000, my senior year of high school in Rome, Italy. Wow. I, was, I went there as an agnostic to party, meet girls, met Jesus, changed my life. How, how did that happen? How, how, did, like that. how are you? Uh, free so trip. Free trip to Rome. My mum said there's this thing called World Youth Day. There'll be hmm. about 2.5 million people there. This is now her accent. Would you like to go? And I thought it was a trick question that maybe <laughs> Rome was an obscure town in South Australia with a population of 15 or something. <laughs> So I said, Rome where? And she said, Italy, you idiot. Right, good. Yes, I'd like to go. I've yeah. done some thinking. Wow. So I just met. I mean, I had the only Christians I had met prior to this trip were those that were really intense and wide-eyed and asking you if you'd been saved. And God bless them. It's mm-hmm. perhaps a fair question to ask me. But yeah. I uh, was just turned off by them. Yeah. But it wasn't until I went to Rome that I was now surrounded by young, intelligent Catholics who were cool and normal mm. and were saving sex for marriage, who believed what the church taught in all of those areas. I was just stunned. Like, how, wow. how do you exist? What are you? It'd be like uh, finding a platypus for the first time. Like, I, don't, I didn't think these things could exist, you know? You know, it's, it's, it's funny you mention that because around 13 or so, 12 or 13, uh, my mother, I think, was trying to make a last-ditch effort to veer me away from atheism. And she said, you should join this youth group at, at the local church. And this was... You know, I don't, I don't want to speak ill of... Uh, but here we of, go. <laughs> but here we go. But, but no, I, I had some wonderful CCD teachers and mm-hmm. people along the way, but this was the most felt bannery of felt bannery churches. And this youth group was extraordinarily, I guess they would call it charismatic. Mm-hmm. And it had all those sappy, ridiculous hymns mm-hmm. from the 70s, you know, like Eagle's Wings mm-hmm. and all this which is heretical as far as I can tell, right? Because you are the one singing, I will raise you up on eagle's wings, which I will never do. Like, I promise you that. Mm. I will never raise anybody up on eagle's wings. But, and I think they, they changed that pronoun because they didn't want to say he will raise you up on eagle's wings because that's very patriarchal. And so, it was, you know, it was this, it really had the opposite effect. It really turned me off. I said, mm. how, how is any man supposed to you thought that at the time as a 13 year old boy <laughs> yeah. not in not retrospectively looking back and finding it no, effeminate I, you thought that at the time no, i was yeah. i was so repelled by by the whole 
aesthetic and and by the soft soap weakness of that that particular kind of catechesis you know i i just I thought this is the this is the worst kind of worldliness. It's mm. pop music that's it's worse not, than the pop music we're getting on the radio. It's not even good. It's not even good. I mean, to quote to quote Hank Hill from King of the Hill, the problem with Christian rock is that it makes both rock and Christianity worse. <laughs> oh know? my it's, gosh, it's, it's, that is so insightful. I, I was so repelled by that. Now I remember there's one time, was this one substitute teacher came into one of my CCD classes, and he was a smart, serious guy. Mm-hmm. And he gave, for us 10-year-olds or whatever, a really good answers to all of our glib questions about the book of Genesis or something. Yeah, yeah. And, and I thought, oh, there's something here that's intellectual. And especially if you're a precocious 13-year-old and you think that you're the smartest person who's ever lived, uh, you know, you've got a little learning. And we know some is, of those. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we have children. <laughs> you may have met a few in your home. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that... The, the the glib sort of catechesis of that era and, and the glibness of the new atheists both were, were really uh, formative yeah. for a, a precocious 13-year-old who thinks he's smarter than he is. Little learning is a dangerous thing. Uh, mm-hmm. and, and I thought, wow, there's just no intellectual depth here. And my way back was this long period of steadily being convinced wait a second smart people believe this can you break that down for us i'd love to hear that story yeah yeah so i was freshman in college and i uh, went to one of the most liberal universities in the country and but i was randomly assigned to uh, this roommate who was who remains you know my best friend to this day best man in each other's weddings and he was quite conservative and he was a cradle Catholic whose family became kind of mega church Protestant. And he was sort of agnostic at the time. But he, he was really taken with the ontological argument for God. And specifically the modal ontological argument mm-hmm, for God, mm-hmm. as formulated by Alvin Plantinga, yeah. the Calvinist guy at Notre Dame. And uh, so he presented this to me, and I got such a kick. And he's not a Christian yet. He's just philosophizing? or he, Well, he was raised kind of broadly Christian, okay. but he was agnostic. But he said, you know, I really get a kick out of this argument. I said, oh. and I had this moment, like Bertrand Russell, where I yes. said, that's the stupidest argument I ever heard. Ooh, but I can't quite it? say why it's wrong. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. why, wait a second, maybe yeah. it's not the stupidest argument I've ever heard. And uh, that got me, even more than what the argument was seeking to prove, it, it convinced me, oh, thoughtful people think about this. And then one of these, you know, are you saved kind of friendly evangelical guys had a f- free book table on campus, and I'm a sucker for free books, mm-hmm. and it was all this silly k- kind of pop apologetics and mere Christianity. And I said, that, that's a nice looking cover. That looks like the c- sort of cover a serious smart person would pick up. Okay, <laughs> So I picked it up and I read it. And you know, the thing about C.S. Lewis is, He's so intelligent, so insightful, but a three-year-old could understand his prose. He's so clear. He's so clear in his writing. And I read that book. I was sitting out. This was summer freshman year, maybe. I was sitting out like true white trash in a beach chair on in my yard in my little little house in new york don't and knock I, it till you try it don't knock it till you we try have it. a we have a couch chair at the front of our house do you we brought it out because we were going to go throw it in the big dumpster and then we <laughs> sat on it and we're like this is actually pretty good this, this is great i don't care what the neighbors say <laughs> go this get me great. a beer yeah <laughs> and so i spark up a cigar i'm sitting in the yard i'm reading c.s lewis for whatever it was a week or two and i thought oh, i think god might exist and that led me to chesterton we're here in the chesterton cigar lounge and that led me to all sorts of other reading. And it, it took me from the age of 18 until probably 21 or 22 to be really convinced that God exists. Little children know this intuitively, yeah. but people who fancy themselves really intelligent, it takes mm-hmm. them years mm-hmm. to understand something that is self-evidently true from the natural world. Yeah. Wow, that's amazing. We, so were you in university at the time? Yeah. And so then what was the, what was the progression there? At that point, did you decide... Okay, God exists, but I'm not sure if Christianity is true, or Christianity is true, but I'm not all sure no, about no. this Catholicism thing. No, I, I, I took as long a time as I possibly could, just <laughs> bumping my head every step of the way. And so I said, okay, God exists. Now I have to, I guess I have to grapple with this person of Jesus Christ. Because, mm. uh, you know, God exists, and so religion, I guess, is good, but why is there this person? Why has it got to be about this person? That's kind of weird. I've got to pray to this person, and... 
I don't know, can't we just take the person out of it? Turns out you can't. Spoiler alert. You <laughs> cannot take the, the person out of God. Uh-huh. And uh, so, Any of them. And, yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's right. Any of the three persons in one divine unity. And so at, at that point, this is probably around 22, I guess. Okay. I, I said, you know, maybe I should read this Bible. You know this book? The, the font of like all Western civilization and sort of the most important book ever written. I guess I should read that at some point. Uh, so I start reading it. From cover? From Genesis? No, I, I had read the book of Genesis before. I was assigned it when I was a teenager. And whenever I th- had this inkling that I should maybe start reading the Bible, I'd always start with Genesis. So I've read the book of Genesis about a thousand times, but I would never make it through the Bible in a year. I'd sort of peter out uh, somewhere in Deuteronomy or something. Yeah. And uh, so I started with the Gospels. Because I, I said, yeah. I want to grapple with this person, Jesus Christ. Okay, start with the Gospels. And as you know, you, you, <laughs> it, it's just so obviously true. You know, uh, C.S. Lewis has that argument, Christ is Lord, liar, or lunatic. And it's so mm, clear. yeah even in the most spectacular uh, scenes in the gospel, this guy is the most sane person in the room. Whatever he is, he is not a lunatic. And whatever he is, he's not a liar because what he is saying is sounds so sane and therefore it sounds so true and I know that I can recognize it as truth. Huh, I guess he's got to be that third option. And some doubters have, have said, well, there's a fourth L and that's uh, legend. Right. It's all just legend. But, you know, that really does not hold up. It doesn't make sense of 11 apostles, you know, going, going to die yeah. all sorts of terrible yeah. deaths. Yeah. And doesn't make sense 500 witnesses, eyewitnesses to the resurrection. And no, that doesn't really mm-hmm. hold up at all. And, and so I said, gosh, I guess, I guess this guy is who he says he is. I had a conversation. I don't know that I've ever said this publicly. I've, men- I've mentioned it, but I've never really gone into it. I had a, a few weeks of very intense private correspondence with the comedian Norm MacDonald. Wow. You know, Norm... It, it, I want you to take an hour to detail exactly <laughs> how that went down because he is one of my fa- absolute favorite comedians. So he was always a... He's my favorite comedian. And I noticed on Twitter... <laughs> I, I was one of the first people he followed when he got on Twitter. He was... Say that again. He I, followed you or you followed... Well, I was following him. Yeah. He, he followed me. And I, <laughs> and I don't know when he started following me, but I, wow. I was just checking through Norm's page. I said, oh, Norm's following me. That's, and he was following, at the time, I think, 60 people. Wow. And, and I thought... And I, I don't know why. I don't know where he saw was something. Was it a mistake? It was it a mistake, <laughs> a happy mistake just, if it was. Yeah. But I, I really didn't get it. And so I, the thing about Twitter is when you each follow each other, you can send private messages. But I said, I was so in awe. I've, I've met plenty of celebrities. Yeah. Truly, truly in awe of this man. I said, I don't want to abuse my follow privileges here. I don't want to send him a private message. And one day... He sent out a tweet where he said, I'm just in such pain. It's just so hard. It's so hard. Mm. Knowing now that he had been fighting cancer for 10 years secretly. Bless him. I now recognize that's what he was talking about. At the time, I read that as this is an eccentric, wild guy. And he's, yep. maybe he's suicidal. And I said, OK, I'm going to reach out. And I just messaged him. And I said, Norm, I've never messaged you before because I'm simply in awe of your genius. Mm-hmm. Uh, but if I can be of any help in what appears to be a moment of despair, please just let me know. And he writes back and he, sa- he says, uh, thank you, Michael. Um, appreciate the note. I'm okay. But I, I would like to talk uh, because to not accept your offer would be, uh, <laughs> would be prideful or something. I said, okay. All right, Norm. What we-? And instantly we, we're, we're talking about religion. And I haven't, I haven't published these. I mean, when I say these were messages, I mean, these were, they wow. became essays that we would wow. write to each other every night for weeks. Huh. Uh, like 800, 900 word essays in some cases, you know. And, and and was it what? You trying to convince him of something? Well, I didn't or? have to convince him of a thing. So when you say they were like essays, what, what, what were you going back and forth about? Suffering? <laughs> well, I, I asked him about suffering. I said, you know, do you... Norm, do you have a view of the world, you know, that sort of can help you make sense of this suffering? And he said, oh, yeah, Michael, I, you know, I know you're a Christian. He said, uh, yeah, I'm, I've just always known that the Bible is true. I've always known that Christianity is true. 
And I, he says, and you can never tell with him because you never know if he's like playing with you because he always played so dumb, but he was yes, so, so yes. brilliant. And he said, I'm not an educated man, which is true. He's not an educated <laughs> okay. man in the sense that he never had really formal schooling. He read everything. I mean, he could probably quote you Tolstoy forwards and backwards. But his, his, actually, his, one of his most famous jokes is this joke about a, a moth going yes, into a podiatrist's office. That's the office. best joke. But it's, a, it's done in the style of the death of Ivan Ilyich yes, by Leo Tolstoy. Right, yeah. A lot of people don't, don't get that. Yes. But you, you would have to read so deeply in the Russian novelists to even think to put that joke together. <laughs> and, but he says to me, I'm not an educated man. He says, my son is much more educated than I am. He's got schooling. I don't. But... Uh, I've just always known that it's true. And I thought, well, you're ahead of, the, ahead of me, buddy. Because mm. <laughs> you know, I do have some schooling, and I didn't know it was true for years. And it went on for about two weeks or so. And I kind of blew it because I didn't write our nightly response one night. And I, let mm. it, I was just busy. I was traveling, whatever. And then it kind of petered out. And I was sort, of, mm. sort of kicked myself for it. He was supposed to come on my book show at PragerU. And had uh, he'd agreed to do it, but he, he, I said, okay, well, he, I'm, Norm, I'm leaving California, so you got to come on this month, basically. And he, d he didn't drive. He, you know, he, he was a quirky guy. He'd always send a car for him. And he said, Michael, I I'm happy to do it. Can we do it on Skype? I said, no, it's not a Skype show, Norm. Mm -hmm. It's an in-person show. You got to come in person. He goes, I can't go into a studio right now. And I thought this was him. He's sort of, it was famously somewhat agoraphobic and <laughs> germaphobic yeah, it yeah. seemed and so i just said okay well norm whenever we get past this covid thing you can come on the show and then he died mm. and i realized then in retrospect he was undergoing pretty serious treatment at right at that time uh, but, but we got on the topic because this was a guy this brilliant guy who just knew it who just opened the bible and just knew that it was true mm. intuitively and i had a less in, intense but similar reaction which is you're reading the gospels yeah and you it just sparkles and you just know that it's true unlike any i've read lots of good books but it's it's like that question that somebody asked you last night about you know how do you argue for what is beautiful and aquinas actually does that and he actually has this very unhelpful line he says uh, the beautiful is that which when seen pleases or something. <laughs> but I liked your point that it's like some things, like we can discourse about these things, but we can also look at them and understand them to be yeah. so. Yeah, and something I, similar was happening with you, it seems like, with the Gospels. It, it was, and just, I, I love uh, St. Thomas Aquinas' answer because it's, it's almost like a norm joke. It's just, <laughs> well, you know, beautiful things are things that when you look at them, you know, they seem beautiful to you. You know, that's kind of what he's <laughs> saying, okay. you know? Yeah. And... Uh, yeah. But, but he writes it in this beautiful way. Uh, but uh, yeah, I kind of go more to the Justice Potter Stewart answer. Mm -hmm. I know it when I see it. And I, I don't mean to be cute with that answer. I think it's actually important that we, that we become more comfortable speaking in that way and thinking in that way. Uh, there was a breaking point in the really shallow pseudo-conservatism that has bedeviled us in this country for the past few decades. And the breaking point was when David French, then a columnist for National Review, defended Drag Queen Story Hour as a blessing of liberty. Mm. And so Rabbi Mari attacked him for it, said, whatever this is, we got to move past this. And it became a whole big debate. And David French's argument was, well, Who's to say? Who's to say? If you tell me that I can't have a drag queen story hour at a public library, why, maybe maybe s someone will say that you can't have church on Sunday. Mm. And just who's to say, you know? One man's drag queen story hour is another man's church. I thought, no, I can say. And you can say, and we can all say, we all know the difference yeah. between a drag queen twerking for kids and a pastor preaching we the gospel. We just have to stop lying. And we have to stop lying. By the way, if you can't know the difference between those things, you certainly cannot have self-government. Self-government is predicated on the idea that we have reliable faculties of reason yes. and a reliable moral conscience, mm -hmm. and we can discern between true and false and, and good and evil. And beautiful and ugly we we actually can and we've we've simply deluded ourselves into denying the 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 very faculties that make us human yeah and so when did you 
so you you read the gospels and and at what point did you decide catholicism is the ticket or was it more just a natural progression since you were raised that way no it wasn't natural if anything i was sort of uh let's see i'm i'm giving up on this lighter that's all right would someone mind getting us one thanks (laughs) michael needs a lighter i need a lighter where's my i need blue m&ms thank you so much uh no, if anything, the fact that I was raised that way made me skeptical of it. And the fact that I was sort of brought back into the faith by a Calvinist philosopher, <laughs> by, a, by a megachurch roommate and a Calvinist <laughs> philosopher at Notre Dame, curiously enough, and C.S. Lewis, yeah. who was, he might have made it had he lived longer, but, you know, was obviously not, not Catholic. Yeah. Uh, it made me skeptical. I also, I didn't get the Mary stuff. Okay, I didn't get the need for the saints. I didn't get the need for the icons. I didn't get the need for the liturgy. Mm. Now I'm really into all of those things. Yeah. And it, it, this is actually why I think it's important that we give an off-ramp to people mm. who have been going so far down the road of liberalism and they recognize that something's gone wrong, but they're going 100 miles an hour. You've got to give them that off-ramp. And f- for me... You know, the off-ramp from atheism was was sort of paved with Protestants yeah, yeah. <laughs> that led me back to uh, the, the one true church. Uh, so I did start going to church at this point. Mm. And I said, okay, if I'm going to go to church, what church should I go to? And this was a bit of a numinous experience, a coincidental experience. I was in New York at a dinner, and the dinner was at this bar in, in Midtown, and they were giving away some conservative books. It was a conservative group. And you had your book by Sean Hannity, and you had your book by these other writers where I thought, I don't know, that's okay. I've read these things before. I don't need to get one. Then I saw this little book, and it had a very interesting ty- uh, cover. Mm-hmm. It's, we can judge books by their cover. This uh, is another uh, thing. No, I am 100% in course. agreement with this. We judge cigars by the band. Yes. We judge, we, we judge people by their looks. Yes. We, we probably we shouldn't, at least if we know them for more than an hour. But in the <laughs> beginning, what else do you have? What else do you have? I mean, that's just what, what it's, you know, prejudice yes. is, is defended by Edmund Burke for good reason. Because you're not going to, you know, write some 50-page uh, uh, analysis of every single decision you have to make. You right. wouldn't be able to get out of bed in the morning. Right. And so I see this cover. And... It says uh, at the top, All nature is but art unknown to thee, all chance direction which thou canst not see, which is Mm. a line from Alexander Pope. Titles, coincidentally, the author, Father George Rutler. Okay. I look on the, but it doesn't say Father, it just says George Rutler. I look on the back, I see it's got a blurb by Bill Buckley, and I was Mm. the first uh, inaugural Buckley Fellow at at Yale. Okay. And I just just left college. And then I, I look and I see it's a Catholic priest. And then I see he's a Catholic priest at a church Two blocks away. Wow. And then I see on the, front, <laughs> on, the, on the front flap it says, it's a wicked generation that seeks signs and wonders, but it's a stupid generation that ignores signs and wonders. I said, wow, okay. And then there's another coincidence. He had left the church that was two blocks away. He was now a, ch- a pastor in Hell's Kitchen at a church <laughs> called the Church of St. Michael. So that's a coincidence. And anyway, <laughs> I start going to church. Yeah. And it really clicked. And this was a reverent Novus Ordo, very, very reverent Beautiful. Novus Ordo, ad orientum, yep. smells and bells. Altar rail. Altar rail. I actually don't know if at that time okay. there was an altar rail, because the church was in disrepair. Mm. Father Rutler was actually sort of rebuilding the place, put a baldachin in, you know. He was Bless re- him. But this, yeah. this thing, they were going to sell it. They were going to knock it down, and he, he really revived it. He and the Holy Spirit revived it. <laughs> uh, but, and I thought, oh, this makes sense. And it's why I'm really angry at the people who destroyed the liturgy. Because yeah. I, I don't know if I would have remained in the church throughout my teenage years had we had a serious liturgy. But I suspect I might have. Yeah, when we were renovating this cigar lounge, we had five layers of shag carpet and tile over these beautiful wooden floors and an awful drop ceiling. And uh, when we explain this to people, they say, who would do that? And, and my answer is the same people who invented liturgical abuse. <laughs> yeah, okay. This Cardinal is Bonini wonderful. Would do it, let's actually, let's yeah. make it awful. Yes. Yeah. Yes, because how can you expect people to take an hour or two out of their Sunday to go 
get exactly the same thing. Just slightly worse. Just slightly worse. Like, the jokes that. of the priest aren't that good. Like, yeah, Norm right. MacDonald's actually better. Yeah, my, like, yeah of course. Y- your guitar band, not as good as what I could be listening to. Like, the Eagles or whoever else. Like, they're way better than you. Right. Why am I here? Why am I here? You know, that uh, the jokes by the priest remind me of a line from Father Rutler, who was very instrumental in my reversion. Who <laughs> He wrote, he said, in, in these new liturgical abuses, you see priests telling jokes like a ham actor in a dying vaudeville show. And those priests would do well to limit their repertoire to the jokes that St. John told the Blessed Mother while her son bled on the cross. Oof. The other thing that does is it makes the priest job a lot easier. Mm-hmm. Like, you don't have to be funny. You don't Isn't that great? Funny. Like, you don't have to be entertaining. You just have to celebrate the holy sacrifice you, of the Mass you, reverently. You just look, all the promises from the liturgical reforms after Vatican II not synonymous with Vatican II, as they would have us believe, but that occurred mm-hmm, after mm-hmm. Vatican II, and which were made easier by Vatican II, obviously, but which are separate. Yeah. Uh, the promise was it's going to bring the youths back to Mass. The young'uns. The young'uns. Did that happen? <laughs> it didn't happen. I don't think that happened. In fact, it feels like there is an unstoppable uh, movement towards tradition. Of course. Like the, 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 the young trad men and women with their 800 children in oversized yeah. suits yes. at Holy Mass, <laughs> breastfeeding without shame. Oh, yes. They're like little weeds that will not be stomped <laughs> down. I don't think that you're going to be able to stop this movement towards what's beautiful. Of course. I, I do go, when I'm traveling, I sometimes have to go to the 1970s brutalist churches uh, with the... I try to find reverent liturgies, mm. and sometimes I'm more successful than others. But, and, but I, and I will also go for confession. Just if I need a, need a confession, I'll go to the nearest church. Yeah. And so I, I go into these churches and they're empty and they're, they're, the median age is 96 and there are no mm. children anywhere to be found. And then I go to my <laughs> Latin mass and they're, it's packed to the gills. You can't get a seat. Uh, you can't even stand. Often you have to stand in the sacristy. And you know the median age is 25 and they've all got a thousand kids. And, yeah. and I think, okay, obviously the we're gonna win the youths back that part was crazy. And then all of the rest of it, the participation, you know, we're going to participate more in the Mass. That's not true. The people who attend the, the crazy liturgies, their eyes are glazed over. They're, they're sort of thinking about their lunch. They're, they're, they're not, they're performing for one another when there's, oh, we're going to make the sign of the peace. For goodness sakes, I went to a, one of these parishes in LA and at the sign of the peace, people would traipse up and down the aisle giving peace signs to one another. The worst is when they do the uh, slingshot peace sign. Uh, those people should be immediately excommunicated. If I were Pope, that's what I would think, happen. I assume it's automatic. Yeah, I, I think so. so. I don't, I'm no canon lawyer, but I think, you know, it, so that you give this performance, but you're not really participating. Where are people participating? People are participating in the Latin Mass when they're focused so intently yeah. on what is happening at the altar in this holy sacrifice. And so the participation thing, that, that was, you know, just totally bogus and and all of these all of the promises that w- that were made did not come true yeah or yeah so, so much so that even if you want to find a novus auto church that's filled it's the one that's being celebrated reverently so yes we have yep. latin mass here on the weekends but we also have a 10 a.m novus auto but it's ad orientum uh you know uh, Nila and uh it's like how how can we be expected to take this religion seriously if you weren't of course. Kind of thing. And the thing is, too, when you, when you eradicate the church of its traditions, you invariably invent new ones. So when we lived in Ireland, my wife and I, I remember uh, when the gifts were, brought, gifts were brought up, they brought up like a, a field hockey stick and a cardboard painting from the children because we offer everything to God. So it's like, you still have traditions. They're just hokey of and course. not ancient or beautiful. Right, we need we need to get rid of the chanted Kyrie and really all of the chant. We need to get rid of that. That's just uh, uh, the people are just doing it as a sort of rote uh, yeah. uh, ritual. So instead, what we're going to mumble our way through? I will raise you up on eagles' wings. And yeah. No, I mean that that becomes not only a rote ritual that no one is really paying any attention to, but it's ugly. It, it's mm-hmm. depressing. You know, I'm, I think of Christopher Alexander this uh, writer on architecture and design, who made a simple observation that people seem to have forgotten. Every space that you are in will either slightly elevate or slightly depress your spirits. Walmart. 
Walmart. I cannot go to Walmart. We're talking about this. <laughs> My wife. I cannot go into Walmart without getting depressed within three minutes. Of course. Yeah. Uh, the the fluorescent lighting. Yeah. I, I insist my wife is going to kill me because it raises our, our <laughs> costs. On, because there's, you know, the incandescent bulbs go out yes, every yes. week. But I, I don't but care. They're more beautiful. They're so much more beautiful. Michael, let me ask you, what happened to your spirits when you walked into Chesterton and Company Cigars? I walked in like a king. Walking in, you know, when you would walk into the old Penn Station in New York, which we can get a little glimpse of in Grand Central, which was the other beautiful train station that they didn't tear down. You walk in, sky-high ceilings, beautiful ornamentation. (laughs) You walk in like a king. Yeah. When they knocked down the old Penn Station, they built this rat maze, Mm. which was the new Penn Station underneath Madison Square Garden, and you you feel like a rat. Mm -hmm. And when you feel like a rat, you behave like a rat. Yeah. And when you feel like a king, you behave like a That's king. Right. You, you look at modern courthouses. This is a, one of the clearest examples. Old courthouses, big, beautiful, solid. And they give you the sense, I bet even if you're the criminal himself, that there is a real solidity to the justice that is being done here. Mm. You walk into a modern courthouse, it's a little office room with some cork board on the top. And you know, you're right. probably scraping your head as you walk it's in. It's not fitting. You, yes, it's not fitting. And you just you have this sense, ah, this is just... Little men, and what, what are mm. they hiding in here? Mm-hmm. What, what is going on in the dark recesses that I can't see? Mm. So as you were kind of coming into the church, had you, I mean, you'd met your wife uh, much earlier, but were you in a relationship at this point? We were. And I, <laughs> I told her, she was coming up to visit New York. She was in D.C. at the time I was in New York. And I said, hey, I know we're going to have this weekend. And, and so you can see your other friends, but Sunday morning, I'm, I'm going to go to... Mass. She goes, what? I said, yeah, I'm going to, I'm, I was convinced last week that it's all true <laughs> and I have an obligation and a desire actually to go to mass. Is that, you know, but you don't have to go, but you should probably, you should go because it's all true by the way. But uh, you don't have to. Goes, okay. Uh, all right. And so we go to mass and she was freaked out. What did she think? She said, I did not sign up for this. I, I started dating this agnostic, sort of, you know, atheist kind of normal guy. I did not. What? I said, I, I, don't, know, I don't know what to How tell you. How long had you been dating at this point? Well, we, because we broke up for college, you know, there was a pretty big mm-hmm. gap in there. But we started dating. We've, we've now, it has now been half of our lives since we started dating. Because we, I was 16 and she was 15 and a half, my much younger child bride. Yeah, yeah. And... So we had then started dating again, really only, I don't know, for about a year or so or less. So it was still... I I bring it up because obviously there's more involved to you embracing Catholicism than simply, we have to go to Mass on Sundays. Right. There's this whole moral component that perhaps you had to introduce her to. Yes, and intellectual component and Mm -hmm. historical component and, and all of it, which I had touched on a little bit. I hadn't... It's not like we did this together. Yeah. At that point. And so she was totally understandably really freaked out by it Mm. i just said look isn't that funny because sometimes you'll take someone to the latin mass and you just expect the sheer beauty will convert them on the spot and you walk out like huh like that was (laughs) awful (laughs) yeah i don't speak that language i don't have any idea what's going on here it's so funny though you think in our crazy culture because you the reaction is sort of like i took her to you know a drug-fueled orgy like hey you've got to get what the hell i I didn't didn't sign sign up up for this this, you weirdo yes (laughs) said no we're going to church actually and so but I just was so convinced it was just so once you see it it's really hard to unsee it Mm. and so I said I I don't know what to tell you it's just I'm the same guy some ways I guess Uh, but I so if you if you trusted my faculties of reason previously I still have those I'm just really convinced this is true she was open minded to it but it was, a, it was a long process. Yeah. If she hadn't have converted, do you suspect you still would have married her? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, because... I, well, it's, it's, hard to, it's hard to say because you grow together or you grow apart. Yeah. Right? So we have been growing together with a little break in the middle uh, for 16 years. Yeah. And so I could see that happening. But uh, Father Rutler, who... Uh, celebrated our wedding mass mm. he said he said oh you know don't when he was giving us advice on this he said no one you know you shouldn't convert for the wedding 
don't do it no. just to check a box. You, these days, you can get a dispensation. I don't know. You could probably do. You could be a Buddhist or something and get a dispensation. I said, convert when you want to convert. You know, convert when you when you believe it, and uh, which is really a smart approach, I think, because. You know, sometimes if you if you push too hard, mm -hmm. people are going to be yeah. very skeptical. But if you say, "Look, here, it's open for you, eternal life, you know, goodness, truth, and beauty, it's open for you." If you <laughs> or want hell, it. whatever you want. Right. Um, there's a saying: "He who is convinced against his will is of the same opinion still." And so sometimes <laughs> we can do a great job at kind of beating people over the head with our brilliant logic. But if I'm not actually bought into what you're saying, then I right. maybe you've won the argument, but I still can't get on board with it. Right, either. right, and then. There was kind of a tipping point, too, where, and this happened with me from the kind of vaguely Protestant view to the Catholic view, which is, okay, I still don't get most of this, but I get enough mm. to trust. To submit my intellect. Yeah. Yes, to submit my intellect to the authority of the church. And I forget who said it. I, I always assume anything I'm quoting is John Henry Newman, Fulton Sheen, Chesterton, or uh, Ronald Knox or something. Worst case, St. Francis is Worst the repository Saint, yeah. of all misattributed <laughs> quotes, right, I think. Yeah. As Winston Churchill famously <laughs> said. Yes. Uh, but there's that line, uh, 10,000 questions don't make one mm. doubt. And that one sort of got me as well, you know. Uh, that was uh, actually, right. that was Norm's idea. 10,000, he said, I don't really know much of anything at all. But I do trust that this is true. Yeah. Which in, in our highly ration, rationalist age. Mm -hmm. But we don't mock. know what women are or what marriage is That's or right. what we sex is for. Yeah, we know if, you yeah. can't, <laughs> you know, if you can't write some 100-page dissertation on this, you do. Yeah. But no, that's how you have to get along in the world. Our, our faculties of reason are relatively small. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, 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 don't know, I, don't, I don't really know advanced calculus very well. You're telling me that I need to be able to totally comprehend the triune God, who by definition yeah. I can't totally. I don't even know how they make plastic. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Yeah, someone's doing it. I just someone's don't know doing how. it. I know yeah. I have it in places, <laughs> but right. Hmm. And it, I mean, it reminds me of that legend about uh, Saint Augustine when he's writing De Trinitatis, hmm. and he's. Have not you heard this legend? I'm not familiar. I have, oh, but right. I'm not familiar with the story. You're about to so he's, he's. Walking along the beach. Oh, sure. Right? Yes. And uh, there's the, the little boy who's uh, yes, take up a and shell, read, no. and he's taking the ocean. He's putting it into a, a hole. Yes. St. Augustine says, hey, kid, what are you doing? He says, oh, uh, I'm going to fill uh, this hole with the yes. entire ocean. He says, well, you can't do that, you dumb kid. I'm paraphrasing the yeah. legend here. I mean, it never happened. <laughs> so, you know, you, <laughs> yeah. you dumb kid. And uh, you can't do that. You know, the whole ocean's not going to fit in that little hole. And the child transforms into an angel and he says that's right Augustine and you're not going to fit God into your little head you're not going to fit the Trinity into your little head and if you could <laughs> it wouldn't be the it wouldn't be worthy of the name God that's right mm. that's right that's beautiful when did you start at the Daily Wire how did that even happen and and I'd love you to share with us how you've handled the kind of exponential success of the platform and being kind of thrust into the limelight more and more it was unexpected. Yeah. The whole thing was unexpected. I knew the guys before the Daily Wire started. Who, who were the guys? Uh, ben and Ben, Andrew. Jeremy, Andrew Clavin. Okay. I knew Drew because I was friends with his son in college. By the way, my sister told me to tell you, Emma, she loves your reading of Clavin's. Oh, thank you. You did such an excellent job on that. What was that called again? Thank you. It was uh, the Another Kingdom Another series. Kingdom, yeah. This, yeah, it was really uh, good. You know, yeah. My wife's a big fan too. Yeah. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, well, you did a great job. Drew has written a thousand novels. He's unreal. We just bought his new book, so shout out for Clavin here. Um, what's it called? Uh, a, a, a turn of mind or a habit of mind? Oh, strange, oh, oh, strange habit yes. of mind. Yes. Well, because when we you say it, his actually. new book, it's hard to know because he has like three of them that just came out. But Strange Habit of Mind. So yeah. he was a novelist. He had, right. He, and with Another Kingdom, he had never written fantasy. Mm. But he just said, I don't know. I just, this just popped into my head. What and a guy. This, what a weird head. What a weird head he's got. You know, no <laughs> hair. It's all brains in there. And uh, he, he wrote it. And it's this beautiful Christian story mm. uh, that you might not know about L.A. and this other magical sort of kingdom. And the reason I did that is 
I, I was an actor, you know, I was, mm. uh, I had, I, I didn't realize that. I met Spencer Clavin. We were in college together. I directed him in opera. We did plays together mm. and had no idea he was conservative, had no idea he was Christian and had no idea that his father was Andrew Clavin, even though I knew, who, you know, Clavin's not a very popular name, but I just didn't put two and two together. I was a little bit thick. And so one day he called me, he said, Michael, my father uh, needs a little help with his communications, mailing lists, those things. I know that you're the only person I know who works in conservative politics and show business. Mm. Uh, other than my father, who has been, uh, is veering into this territory. Could you help him? I said, who's your father? He said, he said, hey, dummy, my father's Andrew Clavin. Who do you think he is? I said, oh, wow, okay. And so we became friends. Coincidentally, we were moving to L.A. at the same time. I was moving there to do all these sorts of low-budget movies and things that are still on Amazon Prime, I'm sure. Though. Shut no, up. no one should watch them. No, no they, they should. should. What's they should. one low-budget film should. I need to look up we on Amazon really today to watch it? <laughs> all of this. No, I did, I did yeah. this movie... The last movie I did called Holly Weird. Write it down, Cameron. Holly Weird. So it was kind of a funny <laughs> movie. It was shot on a shoestring budget. But I think it's a charming movie. And uh, it's fantastic. I'm sure it's going to destroy my political career because it's politically incorrect. <laughs> but Dreams of president. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but we, we moved there at the same time. And they were starting up the precursor company to Daily Wire. And I was friends with Jeremy also through... I knew him through show business because he was running the Friends of Abe, which was the conservative secret society in Hollywood. Mm. So secret that it has a Wikipedia page. And that w had been started by Gary Sinise and John Voight and a few other yeah. conservatives. And so I was in that in New York. And uh, one of my first dinners in L.A. was with my then girlfriend, now wife, at Drew's house mm -hmm. with Ben and his wife. And said, oh, Ben Shapiro, I've seen you on TV. Or, so, you know, oh, hey. So we sort of became pals. And so we knew everybody. And then when Daily Wire gets started, Jeremy calls and he says, hey, can you come and basically be the pizza boy of the Daily Wire? The real job was to help uh, start the social media department because I had done that for political campaigns. Mm. And I was hesitant to take the job. And I said, you know, man, I didn't move to L.A. to get a real job. I moved to L.A. to be a derelict actor and I can keep making money running my political campaigns. And I, I, I don't need this. And he said, you stupid idiot, please let me give you health insurance. Just, it'll be Who fun. is saying this to you? Jeremy. Jeremy, <laughs> I see. Yeah. He said, you dummy. And I said, oh, okay, whatever, I'll take the job. But I was still, you know, I was still, I was shooting a movie yeah. on election day 2016. Went straight from the film set to the Daily Wire election coverage. And I got my show, oddly enough. It wasn't just the blank book. That was an excuse to, for them to give me a show. But <laughs> I actually got my show, Jeremy and the co-CEO Caleb told me later, because of a cigar review that I wrote. In my, and actually, wow. No. Wow. Tabernacle. Yeah, it was this cigar. Wow, that's, that's the way the world works, I guess. I, I, was, I said, oh, you know, I'd like to maybe write a little something for the website, but I don't want to just write some cheap column. I, I want to write a cigar review. And I sent it to Jeremy, and I, it was about this cigar, actually. Interesting. And, and it was, but it was about more than the cigar. You know, it was about all sorts of things relating to the tabernacle and mm. culture and all this. And they, never, they didn't publish the review. They read it, and they said, wow, this guy has something to say, which I found out later, and they gave me a show for it. Oh. And, uh, but and again, it, the company was still so small. Yeah, and at that time, what, you had the Ben Shapiro show. It was Andrew Clavin doing his daily show. Yeah, and then I was the third show. I see. So they launched, technically they only launched with the Ben Shapiro show, but Drew's show was in the works. So the company mm -hmm. really launched with two shows. I was the first new show that they added. But it was still a small company at the time. I remember, you know, we'd get 10,000 viewers on our shows. We thought, we're, oh my gosh, we're famous. Oh, wow, this is really working. It's a relatively small number, as, as you know, mm. having a very popular show. But we thought, wow, this is amazing. Can't get any bigger than this, huh? And then the company just took off like a rocket ship. Do you remember when you began to realize that it was happening? Yeah, I remember every six months I had the realization, whoa, because the company was doubling. It was doubling in size every 18 months, and it continues to do that. Wow. So now the company is a million subscribers. Wow. Not a million listeners. We have way, you know, millions and millions of listeners, but even just of paid members to the Daily Wire, it's a million, you know, hundreds of millions of paid views, all, all this stuff, many new shows. Yeah. And you know, wow, this thing is taking off like a rocket ship. And no one could have predicted it because the company didn't make any sense it was this conservative company started in Hollywood hmm. that had a cultural focus. So the point of the company was to make movies. 
Hmm. Our day job was talking about politics, but the point was not just to comment on culture, but to create culture, which people laughed at. I didn't at. realize that. From the get-go, that was the That was point. always the vision. That's not an government. afterthought. That's what no. it appeared to me, having followed Joel for a while, that, oh, they're now getting now into we'll do movies. Shows, now we'll do but movies. this, was the, this no. was the plan from the beginning. It was always the vision. In fact, we got frustrated. So we said, we are not doing it in the first year or two of the company yeah. when we had no cash. And we're not doing it. Jeremy said, T guys, give it a minute. You know, mm. I mean, this takes a while to spin up something that has not existed before. And the other reason the company didn't make sense is it, it had a, a something of a religious focus too. We all had totally different religious views. Ben was an Orthodox Jew. Jeremy called himself an antinomian Protestant. That's how he defined his Pro super duper Protestant. Caleb uh, was non Trinitarian in his views at the time. Ben, obviously Orthodox mm -hmm. Jew. Uh, Clavin. Clavin was an Anglican, sort of. <laughs> like, an, and now he's sort of more Anglo Catholic. Okay. And I was Catholic. And all we ever wanted to talk about was religion. That's yeah. all we'd, we'd argue about Donald Trump and then we'd, you know, yeah. we'd talk about religion. And somehow it's all taken off. We, we all have as divergent views on even conservative politics mm. as you possibly could have. I mean, I think every view that anyone who might call himself a conservative is represented at the Daily Wire. I'm the trad. <laughs> Jeremy is this uber libertarian with some fondness for the Bush years. Uh, Drew is, Drew comes at politics from completely from left field. You know, Ben has now has a very, very broad audience that even speaks to the center a lot. Then we added Matt Walsh. Matt, you know, has this just incredible deadpan, dry sort of comedic demeanor that you saw come out. In <laughs> I remember moment. I wrote to my friend John Henry and I said, yeah, yeah I, I've been listening to Shapiro, but I, I, need, to, I need to give it a break. It's just a, it's, it's, it's a lot of negativity going on in the world. He said, oh, you've got to come over to Matt Walsh. It's way worse over here. <laughs> yeah, I know, cause the, the, the whole idea when the company started was Ben was going to depress you, and then Drew was going to lift And then Matt spirits. comes in, and Ben looks quite chipper. That's right. <laughs> Actually. <Yeah. laughs> Which is funny, too, with Matt, because he, he is so funny you know I he is like yes. you know I, I always try if we're hanging out I try to say it's like can I get him to crack that giggle you know can I get it you know, so totally, sort of a little huh, uh, you know, say, all right yeah, I got him yeah, I got yeah, him yeah, you know yeah. um, but so it's it, it totally took off and I remember at the time we'd say wow if only we could get the page views that National Review has or if only we could get the listens that conservative review conservative review TV has or whatever Fox News oh my gosh and now, the, you know, the company is, w wouldn't really be compared to any of those. It just does a, it does a totally different thing. Mm. Yeah. How did you handle the success of it? And, you know, what's it like being you walking through an airport? How often are you uh, stopped? Well, I obviously, you know, developed a huge drug problem. Yes. Uh, you, know, you hide it well. So very functional. You, I try to, <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, groupies everywhere. Um, you know, real rock and roll lifestyle. No, it was, the thing that was really fortunate for me. Obviously, all, all those guys were established and married when mm. they got any notoriety, So it's it, and which is good. That's what you want. Mm. And I was the kid, you know, and I guess I remain sort of the kid of the company. Um, but I was engaged to be married. I was settling mm. down, uh, which is good. I would, it, it would not have been good for my soul or life or career uh, had I had that kind of notoriety. Mm -hmm. in it's my very important to have somebody in your life, like my darling wife, yeah. who can just tell you exactly the way things are, isn't yeah. it? It's just good. It's just. And, and even beyond that. And when you don't have someone in your life who's like, yeah. Donald, your hair, really. Your hair, you need like, to there's no one in his life it, yeah. who's, you know. And, you know, sweet little Elisa, she is <laughs> that. I mean, she is. Is she? Uh, yeah, she's the only How person. Do you know her? Oh, sorry. His wife? Oh, no, Alisa. Yeah, you, yeah. That's your wife, So right? her name is Alyssa. Her name is, it's very confusing. Her oh. name is Alyssa. I, I thought Walsh. Oh, I see, yeah. So yeah, Walsh no. and my wife have the same name with the same odd spelling. Oh, interesting. And, yeah, yeah, and, yeah. Uh, but I, yeah, She's I, a powerhouse too, Alyssa Walsh. Oh, she is. She's fabulous. She's wonderful. And, um, you know, I, I've always referred to my wife as Alisa. I don't know why. I pronounce it like an Italian. <laughs> and, but she's the only one I allow to write my show ever. Or to I just uh, did right before Thanksgiving. I just did this little uh, Instagram video that was a little joke on the conservative uncle at Thanksgiving, how to be yeah. the conservative uncle. And that was just an idea she had the night okay. before. We film it the next day, and then it got seven or eight million views. Oh, it, it, took, it probably did better than the Content Daily Wire has a team of yeah. writers putting out. Yeah. And so it, her gut on this is so right. And, and I really 
trust her advice too because mm. she'll just I'll come home some days and she'll say Mac say so, yeah what she goes that thing you said that was lame that was lame that was weak that was not come on come on mate that wasn't that wasn't smart Whatever. Like, well you know, I love her voice I, mean, I, I can know, see how you amazing. felt for her uh, yes. uh, it's a sort of like a Hispanic Hartman is how I do her voice but uh, but you know she's got that that real real solid political gut. So you, you really need that. The other reason that it's not good, and I always caution whenever I give these speeches, and inevitably some 18-year-old comes up to me and says, how hey, do I do this? how do I do this? How do I, how do I, you know, I just want to pontificate all the time. I say, well, the first thing you should do is not do that. You should maybe work on a campaign. I think campaign work is really good, mm. especially for Congress, because it's a national level campaign, but it's campaigned at the local level. So you're going to VFW halls, you're talking to real people, you're seeing how things actually work. It's not very glamorous. They're usually run on a shoestring, so you can, if you're willing to work for little money, you can advance pretty high up. And uh, so that gives you some practical experience. And then you need to read a ton of books. And th the reason for this that's important is if you make a big splash with the views that you hold as a 22-year-old know-nothing, mm -hmm. and then you finally read some books, mm -hmm. well, either you'll just be pigeonholed into that and remain sort of intellectually stunted forever, or you'll recognize that you were wrong about all those things, and then you look like you don't have any principles or know anything at all. So it, that, that was really important, that by the time we took off, we all kind of knew who we were. Mm. Uh, that, would, that is not the case at a lot of places. A, lo a lot of media outlets on the left and the right will just cut, try to churn talent, you know, so they'll just pluck up some 18-year-old and then they wash out two years later. And it's through no fault of th mm -hmm. their own. Mm -hmm. It's just not a good time for them. You know? How do you deal with criticism and angry people on the internet it's easy to joke about especially after you've been through this for a while but in the beginning at least for me it was quite unsettling i wasn't sure what to do with it um you i think the humble approach is to do some soul searching like yeah maybe i am a horrible person like Ooh. that's certainly possible in fact i'm quite convinced that i am i'm just not sure i am for the reasons you're saying but maybe <laughs> you're right H how did you deal with that how do you deal with that now it is sanctifying it actually is sanctifying. I almost never block people on Twitter. I only block people if they attack my family or something. That's the reason. I'll, so I'm, not, I'm, I'm no free speech absolutist. I have no problem with the block button. But I don't use it because it is humbling. There was a guy, some troll on Twitter, who every post I ever made, this guy would respond and say, here's little Mikey again with his hashtag white power, racist, sexist, phobic, whatever, all the things mm -hmm. that they call us. And... Uh, but it was so funny. The diction was so funny. And I, I just kept reading it. And finally, I responded to him one day. I said, I know you mean to, uh, you know, irritate me. But I have to tell you, your diction is so funny, I really get a kick out of these tweets. He deleted his account. <laughs> I was kind of upset. because I thought, These are very funny tweets. Yeah. And sometimes people will make real criticisms. You'll hear uh, uh, people say, never read the comments. I don't think that's true. Read the comments. I don't read all of them, obviously, it waste your whole day, but I do try to read some comments. After that speech last night, Franciscan, mm -hmm. I, I scrolled through the comments just to see, and there was one really good criticism what was of that? my speech. So the premise of my speech, for I, I uh, would hope the entire audience has already poured no over doubt. this, They've has watched, watched every word yeah. of it, but the premise of the speech is uh, science is fake uh, in that it, it just creates representations of the world that mm. do not correspond as well to reality That's with right. the old ones, yeah. right? So, uh, what a, a, a classic example would be to look up the scientific definition of a kiss. You know <laughs> yeah. what I mean? You're like, that is not at all right. what a kiss is. And right. or, you or, might mistakenly believe that it is the yeah. true definition of a kiss, but human but beings no different. Yeah, what does that mean? It's the objective definition mm. of you know, these sort of lips slurping on each other. Yeah. That's not quite it. Or what is a woman? I mean, we, we, that's the yep. question that everyone seems to be talking about. What is a woman? The scientific answer is a woman has two X chromosomes. My answer is a woman is sugar and spice and everything nice. The latter is more accurate. The, w the latter tells you more about what a woman actually is than two X chromosomes. I don't know what that means. Yeah. W what is man's position in the universe? The ancient view is that man is the center of the universe. The, the scientific view is that man is this little dot on a rock circling this ball of gas in this galaxy in mm -hmm. a supercluster in a supercluster in a supercluster complex. Man as the center of the universe is more accurate because man is the nexus of the, of the physical world and, and the 
metaphysical world through his rational soul. We're the, we're the only being in this world that has that, mm -hmm. right? Animals have bodies, but they don't have a rational soul. That's why we don't put kittens on trial for scratching people. And, uh, you know, ideas exist and they have great power, but they don't have bodies. Angels and demons exist and they have great power, but they don't have bodies. We are that nexus. Mm -hmm. We actually are at the center of the universe. And you see this perfectly in the incarnation, right? The incarnation of Jesus Christ is that, is that perfect meaning. And you see this in, in the sacraments. So that tells you more about what things really are. And, and so at that point, people say, well, no, 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 but Michael, the difference is, literally speaking, literally, uh, <laughs> man is on this ball circling in the middle of nowhere in space. I say, well, is that literally true? What do you mean by literally? And this was where the criticism came in. I said, you're saying literally to mean n not figuratively, not symbolically. But there's a problem because the word literal is a paradox because literal refers to letters, which <laughs> are symbols, right? And so I, don't, I really don't know what you mean when you mm. say literally or figuratively. My view of the world is a semiotic view. I think everything has meaning. And so you can't, for you to tell me, no, no, I'm talking about the things without meaning. Well, that's nothing. Everything has meaning. And the criticism was, Michael, you dummy, you have confused signs and symbols. And that's why your speech falls apart. A sign is uh, something that signifies, that denotes a signified. A sign has a direct relation to what it represents. That's why signs are languages in, in themselves, like a stop sign or like letters and words. Whereas a symbol, you see, uh, is uh, that which connotes the symbolized, meaning it has a, a less direct relationship. To bring it to earth, mm. a, a sign is commonly understood by everybody, the meaning of it. A symbol is not necessarily commonly understood. Mm. Different people can have different interpretations of symbols, which is a really, really good criticism. You could have scrolled through 8,000 comments to get an intelligent get one amazing. like that, though. I mean, that's a great... Yeah. But the reason that criticism falls flat is because of the rest of the speech, because the, the premise is off. That criticism would have been true in another time, in another place, mm. when people had common language, when those signs of letters and words really did have a direct relation to where we're represented mm -hmm. that is understood by everybody. The problem with our time is we no longer have a common language. Yeah. So they, the word woman does not denote yes. woman. It's, it, has, it has ceased to be a sign and become a symbol that is now controversial. Man, uh, same thing. Mm -hmm. well, uh, so, so because of the breakdown of language, that no longer holds up. But I thought, wow, I'm so grateful for that criticism because it at least made me think to work through the, that distinction, which I would, would not have given much thought to. Mm. And it actually helped me to make sense of my own thoughts. And that is true. That happened to be a beautifully written criticism. But it's true of all of them. It's true of even, hey, Knowles, stop talking like that. Stop using that dumb word. Hey, hey, Knowles, you look like a jerk. Hey, that actually makes me think, oh, maybe I need to button my jacket. <laughs> oh, maybe I need to. But, but I mean, yeah. surely you have people in your life who do a better job giving you these criticisms than having to scour through YouTube comments. Some. Yeah. I well, mean, is that, is that the advantage of having a team around you at the Daily Wire who get to tell you? Like, don't say that again. Or are they not as uh, micromanaging? Yeah, they're not as micromanaging. And, and sometimes people are wrong, too, you know. Mm -hmm. and, and committees <laughs> rarely uh, do anything good. Mm. <laughs> Individuals often have good perceptions and insights. Committees, not no, so much. No, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, obviously there are, there are close people in my life that yeah. I turn to for that sort of advice. But I also turn to the trolls on Twitter because mm. the, the trolls on Twitter have no care for my feelings. They actually yeah. want to hurt my feelings. And so sometimes you get mm. blunter, harsher, more precise criticism mm. from them. Very good. Let's take a quick break, Neil. And then when we come back, i got some stellar questions and we might have some questions from our locals too. All right. Hey, I want to take a break to say thank you to two of our sponsors. The first being Hallo, which you've obviously heard of by now. It's the best most downloaded Catholic app ever, I think. It is a prayer and meditation app. So if you're looking to learn how to pray the rosary, or if you want to listen to sleep stories, if you want to do Bible studies, if you want to have Mark Wahlberg pray the rosary with you, hallo.com slash Matt Frad. We have a link in the description below. By signing up at that link, you'll get three months for free. 
So if you want to go try it for three months, if you don't like it, you can cancel. You don't have to pay a cent, but I think you'll really like it. I have it on my phone. My wife has it on hers. I think this is changing the way people do adoration though. I don't know about you, but ever since Hallow's become popular, I go into adoration and people do have earbuds in. They might be listening to Metallica, but they might be listening to Hallow. Hallow.com slash Matt Frad. The second thing I want to tell you about is Exodus 90, which is a 90-day ascetical program for men to help you get your spiritual life in order. It starts again uh, this January. So go to exodus90.com slash Matt. Click the link in the description below to learn more about it. If you really do want to take your spiritual life to the next level, seriously consider Exodus 90. For 90 days, you give up things that you'd rather not give up, like warm showers and happiness. And then you, that's, you can still be happy, but you have to take on things that maybe you don't yet do, like praying a, a holy hour every day. So go check them out, exodus90.com slash Matt, and you and a few guys for 90 days can go through this grueling but very rewarding process together. Uh, people who've been through it say that it's really blessed their marriages, their, their, their lives, their spiritual lives. Exodus90.com slash Matt. Burton. It was, so, it was such an honor to be with him. But uh, yeah, are you liking Nashville? I love Nashville. Yeah, I w did not expect myself to live in Nashville. Yeah, what was that like when the news came down that y'all had to leave LA? Oh, I by the way, do you want joy. some bourbon or is it too early? Matt. Uh, Matt, here's the thing. For you, I will make an exception. <laughs> it's five o'clock in Rome right At now. At least, yeah. Anyway, so uh, yeah, what are, we, what are we drinking? This is from my good friend Andrew here, who's over here. And uh, this is Jefferson's Reserve. All right, thank there. you. I hope you don't think less of me if I add a splash of water. Not at all. If I had ice, I'd use it. Yeah, there we um, go. yeah what was that like when it came down the pike that you all had to move to Nashville? That was great. We knew or did you know that you were moving and not yet know which state? We had talked about moving for years just because we knew California was coming to an end. It will either break off into the sea or just be decimated in a shower of fire and brimstone. Uh -huh. So, you know, good old Gomorrah by the sea there yeah. in Los Angeles. And... The, the real turning point was COVID, where we said, we can't stay here. Yeah. And my wife at the time was six months pregnant, seven months pregnant. And we, we lived in this nice little apartment. And we needed a bigger apartment, obviously, with the kid. And, but it was a nice, really nice neighborhood, Brentwood, in, in L.A., where she could go on these walks in beautiful residential areas and very far away from everyone. And so she's walking one day. And she's on one side of the street. There's some guy on the other side of the street, sunshiny L.A., never a rainy day, beautiful, temperate, and this man yells at her and says, you need to put your mask on. Yeah, you this need is to my piss wife. off. My wife at this point is wide. Well, she's a very petite woman. She's at this point wider than she is tall because she's got this giant baby in her, and she's you know, sort of hobbling up just to get a bit of exercise. She said, what? And we, we never locked down. I mean, I think the company had to sent people home by mm -hmm. the law in California. But I didn't do it. I, I made it, I was 36 hours at home. Jeremy didn't spend one day at home. He just went back to the office. And I, I called him and I said, bro, I gotta come. I can't, I'm not getting work done. We live in this shoebox apartment. I'm waking up at 6 a.m. to do the show, waking my wife, I'm not doing this. He's like, yeah, come back, of course. And so we never really locked down. We said, we need, we need, we're doing something here. This is, this is hard to churn up a business like this. So the, the options were Texas, Nashville, or Florida. That's where everybody was going. Yeah. And uh, they, they asked me, where do you want to go? And I said, well, uh, given those choices, I would say Nashville. And they said, good, that's where we're leaning. I said, damn, I just ruined my negotiating position. That's awful. <laughs> but we yeah. did it. And then it was fast. It, I said, I said, because I was looking to buy a house. I said, so... Should I buy a house? He goes, don't buy a house. He goes, when are we going to move to Nashville? He goes, like two weeks. Pack your bags. I was like, okay, pal. And, and we did. Wow. The fi yeah, final day, I was invited to host the Rush Limbaugh show, actually. It was the end of his, hmm. he was dying. Yeah. And so I did it. It was the last thing I did in L.A. And uh, I was going to host it more, but I had a radio contract of my own kicking in on a rival network uh, a few days later. So it was bittersweet and that I would have liked to would have liked to keep doing mm. his show but f wrapped the Rush Limbaugh show got in a car went to the airport left and have not looked back wow and and I mean we used to live in San Diego uh, but is it is it true this mass exodus have you found that to be nope. true in your own life everyone you know is starting to move or when many I, of them when I was moving out of LA I couldn't find moving tape 
I would go to the moving shops. And they would say, so we're sold out. No way. Yeah. And the other thing was you couldn't get U-Hauls because <laughs> they weren't coming back. You <laughs> 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 you all some people take them out. Some people um, take them. What an anecdote. Yeah. And, and so the, the weird thing about Nashville is I thought, well, I'm leaving all my friends. <laughs> but I wasn't. First of all, 80% of Daily Wire moved with us. We told the, the staff, you can stay, you can go, but that's what's happening. 80% said we're leaving. And since then, many of my friends, either for the Daily Wire or just for other reasons, have moved to Nashville. So we didn't lose any. We lost the beach and we lost the sunshine. And we gained the sweet air of freedom. Do you find that many people in Nashville are aware that Daily Wire has moved? Uh, yeah. And, and for the most part, are they supportive or do you have yes. your haters there? Very I'm sure. supportive. When people would come up to me in L.A., it was usually friendlies. Mm -hmm. Usually. Sometimes not. But usually it was. And 70-30. Uh, in Nashville, everybody's cool. Man. Really? Everybody is on the team. Because yeah. the, other, the other thing is in Nashville and Texas and Florida, you'll hear the locals say, don't you California my state. Right. Leave your values at the door. But you don't need to worry about us. Okay. Yeah, the yeah. people who are moving, you're really seeing just a balkanization of the country. The, the conservatives are moving to the red states. The liberals are staying in or moving to the blue states. Mm. And... It's fine by me. Yeah. I wanted to ask you how your Catholicism affects how you comment on the news uh, and on politics. You know, I was reading what Thomas Aquinas had to say about detraction the other day. And I thought to myself, isn't that 95% of what you do? Like, you kind of speak ill of people. And even if you're right, yeah. how can you as a Christian justify doing that? I try not to. Uh, I'm sure I've done it plenty of times, but I, I actually try not to. It's very common in the conservative commentariat to just say, so-and-so is a big, dumb, stupid, evil idiot, and I hate this person, or whatever. I, I don't do that for that reason. It's because I just don't want to have to go to confession every day. Mm -hmm. And uh, so... Wait, wait, yeah, keep going, sir. I, 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 try to, I, tr I try to take a little bit more of a sympathetic approach to these people. You know, this poor AOC is a, a, a wounded soul. She really is a wounded soul. And, and so we, we should... Uh, criticize her rightly but mm -hmm. but not be gratuitous or cruel or mean or anything like that and do you find that's a continual balancing act that sometimes you think that oh, went too far or, or no i mean i think it uh, in some ways I'd, I'd have a bigger show if i were more willing to call people dumb stupid idiots but yeah my other handicap as a conservative pundit is that i don't really get angry i get angry about three times a year it happened yesterday actually <laughs> i was at tsa and i had this lighter not this exact one, but very similar. It's a pipe lighter. Okay. So it had these little doodads in it. And uh -huh. the thing about pipe lighters is it's a soft flame. Mm -hmm. Cigar lighters have that jet flame. There's a soft flame. You cannot take a jet flame on an airplane. You can take a soft flame. And this TSA agent. I didn't realize that, yeah. Yeah. She found my... Oh, and they got rid of... My pre-check didn't go through, so I had to go, you know, in the long line where they're digging through all your stuff. And this person just wanted to take my lighter <laughs> and and the guy pulls it out this woman she says you can't have that on the plane i said i can i'm just telling you i know for a fact i've flown <laughs> on this very airline twice in the last five days that is tsa compliance she goes no it's not i said it is actually no it's not no it's not back and forth back and forth and she goes to the supervisor and the supervisor said yeah that's fine she's so angry <laughs> another just saying i gotta get this lighter from him and so they say well and i'm not joking i said well this this doodad here, this could be a knife. You're kidding. It's not a knife. It's a pipe cleaner. I said, what could I do? I, can't, I couldn't break my own skin with this. I said, no, it's not. You can't. And I said, it's, I promise you this is fine. And luckily the supervisor let me through. Oh, she did. So you kept it. I did keep it. Okay. I was not leaving without it. I would have <laughs> shut down that airport. Matt. I was not. Sometimes. But so that is. And I, I actually, the whole time I was Just thinking. thinking was like, of the headlines on Daily Wire right now. Yeah, I, Knowles I, shuts down airport. Knowles shuts down airport over pipe lighter. Mm -hmm. And I, I was so. And at the time I was thinking, don't lose your temper because then you will have to go to confession like tomorrow and then it's just don't do it, you know, because I dread the loss of heaven and the pains of hell, but I also don't want to offend thee, Lord. And so don't, you know, on the verge of my seat. But it, that happens rarely. I, I really don't get angry in, in, in politics. And in conservative media, you either have to be extremely funny or extremely angry. That's usually mm, the rule. Interesting. And I uh, say with no false modesty, I don't think I'm extremely either of those things. Mm. And, uh, but, but whatever, I, even if it costs me some views, I, I am conscious of that yeah. because uh, one, it doesn't suit my disposition, but, but two, you know, 
don't don't call another man Raka, or he'll be he'll be li- you'll be liable to the fire. Well, I mean that's right, and and yet I I understand. I mean I'm so glad Daily Wire exists. I think one of the things Daily Wire does is it reminds those of us who listen that we're not the insane ones who are being continually gaslit by the left. Uh, you come in and remind us, actually, no, you're, you're right here, don't worry, you know, and here's yep. why you're right. It's like, oh, thank God, I thought I was insane, yep. you know? Yep. So I, so I understand, I guess, why we have to comment on these things, and I suppose what would be the justification for calling somebody out, perhaps if somebody says something publicly, it yep. now is in the public domain and can be, ref, can be refuted publicly. And, and also, this was almost certainly apocryphal, but uh, there is this legend we have, which has a lot of tr- truth value to it, that uh, St. Nicholas, Santa Claus, you yeah. know, goes up and smacks Arius across the face. And I, I think that can be a good thing. But it was a corrective yeah. slap, okay. according to the legend. Yeah. He wasn't slugging him. You know, it was yeah, a corrective yeah. slap. Okay. And so we should give corrective slaps. Yeah. And, and we should speak the truth in love. But yeah. we should speak the truth as well. And uh, I think if you do so in a calm way, maybe you even laugh a little bit about it, I, I think that can be pretty effective. And I, I don't think there's anything immoral about doing that. I mean, right. when, when uh, Balenciaga... Uh, runs an ad for their products that it, it alludes to child pornography. I think we should say this is evil, and the people who are doing this are really compromising Vicious their souls, and, idiots, and yeah. these are they're doing really evil things, yeah. and they really need to cut it out. So, how do you think you? How does your Catholicism affect how you comment on politics? It, just, just in the way you've said. It yes, and it broadens it out. In, in, in the way that uh, John Henry Newman said, uh, to read history is to cease to be Protestant. <laughs> and, <laughs> which I try not to say on the show. I don't want to be too mean to the, you know, the Our beautiful wonderful Protestants. Protestant listeners. Yes. We're often doing a better job than we Catholics. That's right, right. But uh, what really helps there is conservatives are very reactive to everything. We, you know, we mock the left for calling everyone a Nazi, but we do it too sometimes. And... Uh, uh, People make two historical comparisons ever: <laughs> Hitler and the fall of Rome. That's it. That's it. There's that, no that's the only. Those yeah. are the only events that ever happened in history. <laughs> and the thing is, people who only make those two historical comparisons don't understand those two things either. Okay. You know, if you don't have any sort of sense of history, then uh, you're you're like you're liable to make really sort of shallow, mm. fashionable observations and claims about politics. But if you're Catholic, you know, things are very complicated. You know, and there's no, so a good example of this. We were talking about free speech earlier. Is it became really fashionable over the last five years for conservatives to adopt this free speech absolutist position. Mm. I did not fall into that, mm. whereas many other conservatives did, and I did not fall into that in part because I'm a Catholic. You know, we have a list of banned books. Mm-hmm. Okay, mm-hmm. I know that. Uh, we mock book burning as the greatest of all evils. There's book burning in the Book of Acts. You know, mm. people ban their sorcery books. I know that Plato advocated banning the books of, of his uh, philosophical rivals. Mm-hmm. And uh, I know that there's a position to be, there, there's a good argument for restricting certain views. I mean, St. Thomas Aquinas says that heretics ought to be executed. You know, so that, that does not, uh, I, I haven't, you know, called for AOC to be executed because of her horrible political views. But it just, it, it shows you that things are a little bit more complicated than whatever stupid five-point manifesto you read on the back of a napkin these days. Right. And, and there's, there's a good argument for standards and for suppressing things. I mean, if, if you're a Catholic, you believe that error has no rights. Mm-hmm. And I know we're, we're not supposed to say that anymore because we're uh, marrying ourselves to the spirit of the age. But if you marry yourself to the spirit of the age, you'll find yourself a widow in the next age. And so... Uh, an argument for Catholicism beyond, you know, uh, the prospect of heaven and uh, living heaven on earth is also, it will protect you from, from the errors of passing fashions. Mm. Um, who's more likely to convert, Ben Shapiro or Dennis Prager? If you had to put money on it. <laughs> hmm. I would have said Dennis, because Dennis... Dennis is... What a lovable guy, by the way. I don't know anything so about lovable. him. I've watched a few videos. I just think I would love to have a cigar with this fella. It, it is a wonderful experience to have a cigar with Dennis Prager. One time we were having a cigar, <laughs> and Drew and I were trying to convert him. And uh, he said, now, fellas, I have a great deal of respect for Christians. I hold views that many Christians hold. But I have to tell you... This grace thing, this heaven thing, I cannot do it 
I said, Dennis, what do you mean? Heaven, heaven's your problem? Grace is your... <laughs> no, fellas. You Christians have this idea that you do not earn heaven. I said, well, that's true. You know, we do work to cooperate with God's grace and other things, but yeah, that's true. We don't earn our salvation. Yes, that will not work for me, fellas. <laughs> I am a capitalist. I believe in earning things. I said, okay, well, that's a tough one to get over. <laughs> Dennis, okay. And then Ben has, has read a, quite a lot. And when he was writing one of his books a few years ago, he got really into Thomas Aquinas. Hmm. So this is good. It's amazing. He got really into C.S. Lewis. He got wow. really into... I said, we... What specifically was he reading in these authors? The Summa. He was reading. Yeah, but what specifically? I mean, the Summa. Within the Summa, right. Yeah. I, don't, I don't remember what specifically yeah. he was reading for his book. And then Lewis, he read a lot of Lewis. Wow. I mean, mere Christianity, but lots and lots of Lewis. And we thought, all right, Ben, are we going to get you? But <laughs> I don't know. I mean, it would be difficult because Ben has a fairly rigorous and systematic religious thought. Uh, and so it's, it's not that he doesn't know why he thinks what he thinks. Yeah. And because there's such a cultural component to it, you know. But we're working on it. Hope springs eternally. <laughs> yeah. Well, it was great to see him have Ed Fazer on the show. Mm -hmm. You know. It's funny, for all the criticism Ben gets um, online, among even Catholics and, and Christians, yeah. I mean, here he is hiring two out-and-out -out Catholics and giving Ed Fazer a platform. And Here's the other thing. You know, occasionally we'll see some comment from probably some bot or troll or something that says how how dare you catholics work for that dirty rotten jew ben shapiro i think well you know that dirty rotten jew ben shapiro has given quite a platform to christians and they don't tell me what to say yeah. they never say you know michael uh, you need to drop this tenet of your faith i think you know if if uh Ben is this great uh, oppressor or suppressor of Christians. He's certainly not doing a very good job it's at failing. I mean, this company is overwhelmingly Catholic and yeah. almost entirely Christian, and so I, I just yeah. Yeah, that. But the criticism of Ben really is because he's successful. That's mm -hmm. what it comes from. You know, yes, people disagree with his views. I, I disagree with lots of things. We, you know, all of us at Daily Wire bicker all the time. But the reason he gets the hate that he gets is because he's the we call top it dog. You know? Tall poppy syndrome in yeah. Australia. That's you right. You know, if you're doing well, we need to cut you down so you come back down here with us. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Good for him. I remember when he was on uh, Dave Rubin's show back in the day. Dave said, "Well, I'm certainly not in the top one percent. You know, financially." And Ben's like, "Oh, I am. I'm super <laughs> yeah. proud of that." I thought, well, "That's fantastic. Good for him." I know. And the other, the other thing about Ben, also because he was so grounded when he really became a, a sensation, it has not gotten to him. Yeah. That's why he can say, oh, yeah, I'm super rich now. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I just bought a new car. It's great. I love my new car. And he can say it because he doesn't fall into false modesty. Yeah. He doesn't fall into, you know, my mother washed more floors for less money than your mother did. Yeah. He says, yeah, it's amazing. Can you believe this? But Ben is still a guy who carries his own suitcase, you know, which is not true of most guys who become really big. Hmm. We have some questions here from our Locals supporter. I've basically moved pretty much over from Patreon to Locals. Have you? It's been a much more enjoyable Speaking of our experience. pal Dave Rubin. That's right. No, I, I actually love Dave. He, he, I think that's one thing, Cameron, you'd probably say of both Dave and uh, Knowles, while you enjoy listening to them more than others, is you do have this sort of lighthearted... You know, you said you're not especially angry, and, yeah. and there's a big market for that, actually, because you, you, you so. don't listen to anger for so long before you kind of get burned out on it. And I just can't do it. I mean, I... I bet I would have a bigger show. I think, uh, maybe not, but I think I would have a bigger show if I got angrier. But it would just be so false. Yeah, I just is. You. I just you got to be heart. who you are. You really do. Yeah, and yeah. there's that line from Chesterton. You know, the angels can fly because they can t take themselves lightly. Right. Well, let's see. We'll, we'll just scroll through here now. I haven't read these questions ahead of time, so apologies for any that are. We'll see. That's great. Michael says Veritas. Do you think the time spent on your hair is sinful, or is it a manifestation of God's glory? Well, I, I just reject the premise. The time spent on my hair, I wake up like this. Amazing. I roll out of bed, I sit like this. Great. And so therefore, because it has no human artifice to it, obviously <laughs> a manifestation of God's glory. Uh, Wilhelm says, Michael, do you and Matt Walsh go to the same church? Ooh. Yes and no. Uh, Matt was coming to our church, wonderful Latin Mass Parish in, in uh, Nashville. But Matt loves to live in the hinterlands. Matt, I mean, when we first started working with him, he was living in the woods somewhere, near an FSSP parish, actually. And he was doing a show in his car. Yeah. And so Matt lives, his house is so far away. And so I think often he will go to a church that's nearer to his. But, and the other problem with our parish right now in Nashville is we don't have a church. 
because uh, it got blown away by a tornado. Yeah, George so. was saying that in, a, in my interview with him. It's amazing, yes, because George, Candace's husband, and I uh, go to the same church. Yeah. And we meet in the upper room. We, we meet up. Uh, it's just very biblical. Thank you, Rob. Rob has brought us some port here to drink. Some port. Do you know, did you know that I... I'm a port fanatic. That's exactly oh, why I brought it. I love it. I love it. It's not port. true. I didn't know that at all, but we'll have some. <laughs> all right. And we'll uh, carry you back to the car. That's good, yeah. Uh, De- uh, Devlin says, I have followed Michael since he did reviews on Andrew Clavin's show. I really appreciate the work they all do at Daily Wire. Thank you for your Catholic faith. Oh, thank you. That's uh, it. There's no question. Michael says, right. does it bother you, Michael, that Daily Wire Plus hosts blatantly anti-Catholic content targeted at children? I am specifically referring to PragerU History for Kids episode about Galileo. Unrelated mm-hmm. side note. Well, let's, let's not do the unrelated side note because yeah. that was a pretty intense question. <laughs> yeah. I, I haven't seen that content, but uh, it's uh, curious that that question would be raised about PragerU because um, I, I have a show on PragerU, which is also hosted on Daily Wire Plus called The Book Club. Mm. And we covered Galileo. So I did, uh, what is it, the the, uh, Two World Systems, the sort of famous Galileo book. And I was pretty harsh on Galileo, actually. Mm. So I I don't know who did the video for PragerU, but, uh, you know. You're also not a Catholic company. Well, when Prayer you certainly isn't. It certainly isn't. And Daily Wire isn't explicitly. I I would think that, like, the diversity among the commentators is actually a strength of yours. Like you said earlier, you can kind of find yourself in there. Yeah, of of course. Even with uh, Candace and... uh, her relationship with Ye and the things he said recently. I mean, in some companies, Candace might be fired by an insecure boss who doesn't want her disagreeing oh, with him. Oh, yeah. I mean, goodness, the, the way that they handled that, all of the guys at the company, and especially Ben, obviously, because he's the guy with the yarmulke on, I thought was just masterful. And she said, yeah, I disagree with Candace. I disagree with Kanye. But she's, he said the, the multiplicity of views is a, is a feature, not a bug of the Daily Wire. And so I, I think, uh, yeah, I'm sure I disagree mm. with plenty of people who are on Daily Well, I know I disagree with plenty of people on Daily Wire and PragerU, but... Uh, I don't know. They let me talk, yeah. right? They let me. So I, I think that's what more do you want? Do you have people who try to keep their finger on the pulse as far as here's what YouTube will ban you for? Don't don't trip over this wire. Well, yeah. Well, we all know it. Um, I don't need a team to tell me that. We all know what that is. I mean, the the social media companies told us. But it feels like you flirt with that line frequently, and I'm glad for it. I'm glad you do, <laughs> I do. it. Yeah, I do. Because I, I I mean, what would happen if I, Michael Knowles got banned tomorrow from YouTube? The world would collapse. It would. Yeah, I it think. Would what would we do? It it. Uh, Shapiro I, would have to quit? He would have to quit. Find he a different would, job? He would, he would quit in disgust at the banning of me. Uh, I do flirt with the line more. I am I am drawn like a moth to a flame to, to that line. I had episodes of my show taken down because of the big tech censorship, mm. uh, especially during COVID, when uh, some of us knew early on that it was all a political operation <laughs> and that a lot of the claims that were being made about COVID were just ridiculous. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I had episodes taken down, but people didn't tell me, Michael, how dare you say that? They would just say, okay, you got to say that in the, in the member section yeah. because the, the, you, w- you will not be able to say it, period. That's the, that's the world we live in. And that, that's not unique to our times. That's been true for all of history. Haley says, when you write, Michael, do you spend a crazy amount of time editing and whittling the thoughts down? Or is it generally easy to construct and organize your thoughts before putting pen to paper figuratively? It, I am such a slow writer. So I don't spend as much time editing. I spend ages writing. And, and I'm, I, I refuse uh, ghost writers, which is common in the industry, but I, I refuse any ghost writers mm. or I even refuse much editing. Though I have editors, but I, I, dis, uh, I reject a lot of the edits because I really, I am obsessive about diction and syntax and prose and I want to precisely uh, say exactly what I'm going to say. So the downside of that is my output is relatively low. I've only written one book. My colleagues have written like a thousand. Mm. But but I I make sure that pretty much every syllable is exactly what I want Mm. to say. Do you feel that? Do you find that? uh, Do you feel pressure? Like you've got to keep cranking out stuff? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I totally fail at it. But I don't don't care. I mean, publishers have pitched me so many books that they want me to write, some of which might have been fine. But I just think, no. I I had this other problem going into writing, which is that I got notoriety for a blank book. And so I I just knew. (laughs) Have you been thinking, sorry. Yeah. No. Have you been thinking like, we need another book like this? What else can we, another blank book? The anniversary edition. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. The the, the critical Norton edition. I I just knew. AOC's brilliant insights into (laughs) politics or something. Joe Joe Biden's, you know, brain or something. I, I knew going into writing a real book 
the bar would be much higher for me because the headline wrote itself, right? Noel should stick to what he knows. <laughs> should go, go back to his first genre. <laughs> right. and, and so, yeah, I, there's, there is an intense pressure. But I, I, I think of a guy like Owen Barfield, actually, who keeps coming up. Yeah. He didn't publish a ton, uh, but his books really count. And I think I'd, I'd much rather write five yep. books that really count than 20 books that are... Weak. Yeah. You know, something's come up a couple of times in this interview that I've just loved and I'm going to reflect on more and more, and that's this idea of giving people an off-ramp, right? Like, how do we love those who, like us, have been raised in this society, you know? And sometimes I'm afraid that those struggling with gender dysphoria are like the children of... Uh, fighting parents who are just yeah. yelling at each other, but the child gets overseen. How do we tend to their needs and, and genuinely love them and seek to help them while at the same time excoriating the insane worldview? Well, they're not, they're not just like the children of fighting parents. They usually are the children of fighting parents or kind of broken mm -hmm. homes. Or, mm -hmm. and, and in a way, we all are in this, this culture where the family has collapsed. So, yes, I, I go back to Porsche's monologue from the merchant of venice which will probably get me canceled like kanye you know that there are all you know all those accusations about that play but she says though justice be thy plea consider this in the course of justice none of us should see salvation and and so you know you you really do have to look at that and say there but for the grace of god go i and and try to give people uh you know the grace that you would like to yeah. see extended to you yeah uh let's see here i am says I don't know if it's the great I am, but it's Ooh. the lesser I am. Says I still think my favorite brand is Southern Draw. Maybe because it's a, hmm. a Texas thing. Have you had Southern Draw? No. It's an excellent cigar. I thought I'd had every cigar ever made. I'll give you some to go. Right. Um, yes, yeah, it's really good. I think I think it's a Nicaraguan made. I think based in in Dallas. What's your favorite cigar? What do you? If you, you Cuban or non-Cuban? Uh, I know we're not allowed. Let's to do Cuban. both. Let's do Cuban. You know when I was here with George Farmer. I hope he doesn't mind me saying this. <laughs> he was sitting there. I was sitting here. We're smoking. He's like, do you like that cigar? Because he brought me a whole. I'm like, yeah, this is great. Like, That's about $800. <laughs> My gosh! <laughs> I, I was just, I was in, in London. I, yeah, I'm the godfather to George's okay. daughter. Yeah. So we fly to London. And George, he, he doesn't really drink usually. He doesn't. But his real expensive taste is cigars. He has only the very best. And always Cuban. So we're sitting there after the baptism, after the dinner, and we're sitting around. He says, "Let's have some cigars," and he pulls out Bahike Fifty Twos. Explain this to me. I don't Th know. This is probably about an eight hundred dollar cigar, and he pulled out however many he had, three or four. Passes them out, one for me, one for him, and I know that only he and I knew what this cigar was, and everyone else just smoking. I didn't give him a swish or sweet. They probably would have thought the same thing. But to you know, life is very short. Potentially shortened by these, though I actually think that uh, cigars have great health benefits. And we'll get back to that. We'll get back to that in a second. But I think life is too short to smoke bad cigars. Not saying that you or I should purchase you know eight hundred cigars, but here's my theory, right? When it comes to whiskey, when it comes to cigars, boys don't enjoy whiskey, nor should they. But I mean, like eighteen-year-olds and twenty-year-olds, you know. And when they finally develop a taste for it, they immediately become pretentious and yeah. try to buy the most expensive bottles they can. But what I think would be helpful is if we all began with really bad cigars yeah. so we could then tell the difference. Because when you start with excellent cigars, where do you go? It, it killed me. My first cigar was a Cuban cigar. Okay. A cheaper Cuban, but a Cuban. And so I went in and I loved it right away. I hate, I'd never smoked cigarettes, never got into pot, but I loved cigars. And it is tough. I would be a much richer man. Had I not started with good cigars. Help. But I, yeah. I, I agree with you on the, the whiskey stuff. I don't, I'm, I'm just not sophisticated enough. So I'll go cheap on whiskey, mm -hmm. relatively cheap on wine. My, my, my thought is that all bourbons are identical and anybody who tells you different is just lying. <laughs> yeah. So I, I like to buy the kind of bourbon where one liter is actually bigger than the brand Ooh. because that's their selling point, <laughs> that it's a liter of cheap $12 bourbon. I think all bourbons are the same. Well, I think the plastic, that's the higher end That's stuff, what right? you that's want. That's what you yeah, want. With the grip on it <laughs> so you don't, yeah, it doesn't right. easily slip out. <laughs> But scotch is not, that's not true. I mean, Lagavulin is the greatest scotch in it's my estimation. It's fabulous, yeah. yes. I, someone gave me a bottle of Macallan 18. Yeah. And I'm sipping it very slowly. But I did have this thought, for people who don't know anything about whiskey, once I finish it, I've got to pour the swill into that, and then I pour it to people, and they'll think they're having a wonderful... Is, would yeah. that be immoral? Uh, would it be a lie is the question, because I would suppose that lying is always immoral. <laughs> Maybe if you didn't tell them yeah. necessarily. 
and just said, this is really quite good. This is quite good. You put anything in a crystal decanter. Yes. And it's great. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So health benefits of cigars. I smoke probably a cigar a day. I'm about there, yeah. yeah. And what, 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 what's your response to criticisms about that? Does it relax you? Does it allow you to contemplate things? Do you smoke alone or do you smoke with other people? I usually both? smoke in the morning. Do you? I, I much prefer a morning cigar over coffee than a night cigar. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I usually am alone here. Yeah. I like it very much. I love cigars alone. But this is very enjoyable. Yes. I mean, a good conversation. I, I yeah. read somewhere, it was one of those quotes in a cigar lounge somewhere, that a cigar is as good as the experience you're having while you're smoking. Yeah. And sometimes we can have good experiences alone. But I, I like it with people too. I said probably 60-40 alone with, and with people. But the, the cigars are very good because they allow you to contemplate eternity. Mm -hmm. they do. There's a great song by the Mills Brothers. Where do they go, these smoke rings I blow each night? Where do they fade, these circles of blue and white? Oh, smoke rings I love, please take me above. Take me with you. So Very good. Thank you. I'm going to have and some port here. I, that would, I know, I've got to catch up. you got to. They do that. And also, this is not an original idea, but I'll claim it for myself. I'm sure I read it in First Things or something. Cigars, like other forms of smoked tobacco, correspond to the tripartite soul. Let's do it. So the pipe, uh -huh. as I use this pipe lighter. I see a pipe over there, a nice Meerschaum pipe corresponds to the logical part of the soul, right? You see it's got the joint of the masculine and the feminine, the masculine mm -hmm. stem, the feminine bowl. You, th you think of the professor mm -hmm. smoking the pipe, the philosopher, he tamps it, it's a very involved experience. Yep. The cigarette corresponds to the appetitive part of the soul. Uh -huh. right? I need it now. I need it, give it, <laughs> give me, give me, give me. And the cigar corresponds to the thematic part of the soul. The cigar corresponds to that spirited part, the chest. The cigar is, is frankly more about what you blow out than what you take in. You don't mm. inhale a cigar, mm. ordinarily. And uh, so I, I like that. So I'm draw I've tried pipes, barely tried cigarettes, but the cigar really does it. And I think, to quote Winston Churchill, I have taken more out of cigars than cigars have taken out of me. I like it. Tobacco is a dirty weed. I like it. It satisfies no normal need. I like it. It makes you sick. It makes you lean. It takes the hair right off your bean. It's the worst damn stuff I've ever seen. I like it. <laughs> yeah, very good. I do too. I remember the first time I smoked it. My, my father-in-law was a big uh, cigar smoker. Hmm. And uh, I remember once, love, my wife left with the kids shoot somewhere overnight. I thought, I'm going to get a good cigar, uh, sit out the front and smoke it. This is the first time I really smoked a cigar. And I didn't realize... How old were you? 25, 26. I didn't realize just how sick you could get from a cigar. But I now know... So now at the first hint of a head rush, I put the cigar down. Yeah. I've yeah. learned my lesson. I, I started smoking cigars at 15 down the Jersey Shore with a bottle of port. Mm -hmm. And I didn't think I would like it. And I really did like it. And I really got into it. I wrote my college essay about how much I love cigars. Did you? It was called The Count of Monte Cristo. Oh, fantastic. And I found out later that the admissions department debated whether or not to let a guy in who wrote. But that's not <laughs> something I care about quite, yeah. quite a lot. Started cigar clubs, you know, and all these yeah. sorts of things. And uh, it's, well, it's I, I'm a fan of anything that forces people to sit, mm -hmm. even uh, board games. Yeah. You know, when people sit down for multiple hours and look at each other, and there's no screens involved, yeah. I'm a fan. Totally. And by the way, if, if we're debating, you know, whether it's immoral or something because it's uh, un unhealthy, some argue. Obviously, not me. Uh, let's not forget the many saints and popes mm -hmm. who have used tobacco. St. Philip Neri, one of the arguments from the devil's advocate against his canonization was that his body was not corrupt. You know Because he was missing part of his nose, part of okay. the septum. Yeah. Why was he? Because he took so much nasal snuff during his <laughs> lifetime. It was not that it had uh, been corrupted after he died. It was during his life. That's I mean, amazing. You think about Pope Benedict. I think the man still smokes Marlboro Reds. Mm. He's like a thousand years old. He still smokes. <laughs> Fine by me. Well, I think we should all smoke in moderation, and by that I mean no more than one at a time. <laughs> I, honestly, I think more than one at a time is probably excessive. Yeah. yeah. I, I mean, even sweet little Lisa hates it, but she, she knows. It, it is actually an important part of my day because I smoke at night, and I sit out. Well, now it's freezing in Nashville, but I, try, I sit up, put earmuffs on. I sit out, <laughs> and I have a book, and it's, I, I try to do it every night. Maybe it's more like four or five times a week, but I do it. It's the only time I get to read i get yeah. to think i get to look up at and the it's stars. a commitment isn't it you light that cigar you're now there for an hour hour yeah. and a half yeah you can't rush a cigar right 
right? And, and without it, too. It's, it's important for my job in that if all I do is read the news, I'm going to have some stupid reactive take to whatever. You know, mm -hmm. they just passed this bill or whatever. If I sit out at night and I read, I don't know, whatever, Dante, or I, I read... I, I like reading poetry, or, but it could be stranger poetry. It could be, or it could be just some bizarre book about whatever. That will inform my commentary. You know, mm. uh, these guys keep cropping up. We talk about Ch Chesterton or mm -hmm. Lewis or Belloc or Barfield or whoever. They they have informed my political commentary much more than uh, yeah. I don't know. Even Thomas Sowell. I like Thomas Sowell. It's not a knock on yeah. Thomas Sowell, but. It, they have informed my commentary, frankly, probably more than Edmund Burke or, mm. or people like that. So what do you do to relax then? How do you... Because I would imagine in your job, Twitter is an essential part of your job. You kind of have to be... Yeah. It's going to add... Quote 20, tweeting people. It's going to add 10 million years to purgatory for me. The it way might. That I doom scroll on Twitter. <laughs> like Shapiro told me to. Um, yeah, that's right. And just to interject here, you're talking about cigars slowing things down. We're right at 2 o'clock. So okay, thank you. Yeah. We'll wrap up here and then we're going to do a bonus section for our local supporters. Right, that'll be the port section. And I'm gonna, that's going to be the port section. And I'm going to ask you three questions that I think would get us banned on YouTube. So mattfrad.locals.com slash support. Become a supporter to watch the video. Great. Now, obviously, everybody uh, is, is familiar with you probably who watches my show. But maybe for those who aren't, how can they find the stuff that you do? The Michael Knowles Show. For now, uh, you've probably gotten me banned during this conversation. Yeah. You can find me on Twitter at Michael J. Knowles. <laughs> you can find me, at, of course, at The Daily Wire uh, at MichaelJKnowles.com. I sort of list all the stuff that I do there. Uh, you can find my books on Amazon. Again, for now, I don't, I don't know how long that's going to last. Mm. Uh, and, and you can find me at Chesterton Cigar Bar smoking a cigar. And I would say, like, you know, I think it is important that people support Daily Wire. I, you didn't ask me to do this, obviously, but I do <laughs> think it's important. I mean, whether or not you agree with everything that Daily Wire is putting out, like, don't you want to invest in a company that's at least trying to push back and has the, has the wherewithal to push back against the, the, big, the big tech giants? Well, this is, I, I always get into big debates with Jeremy over Ayn Rand. He loves mm -hmm. Ayn Rand. Okay. I hate Ayn Rand. Mm -hmm. right? I think it's the worst book ever written, and he just ad adores it. And... The insight, I have to hand it to Jeremy, I have to hand it to Ayn Rand, is that you need to have money, <laughs> okay? Money talks and BS walks when mm -hmm. we're talking about politics, okay? And, and on the right, the model had been nonprofit. You just whine, 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 and you raise money. Mm -hmm. And then you raise money, and then you lose, so that you can whine some more and raise some more money. You saw a lot of this in some of the way Republicans would raise money on pro-life issues. They usually wouldn't want abortion to be banned, or often would not want abortion to be banned, because that would hurt their fundraising, right? There's mm -hmm. this horrible, perverse incentive to lose. And... Uh, or you'd have some cable networks that were just bundled up and whatever, they'd just give you schlock. Jeremy and Daily Wire have made a point. We need to make money. We need to make $1 more than we spend. Mm. So when we put out movies, I did a documentary on Dr. Fauci. Candace just did a documentary on George Floyd. Uh, Matt did the documentary on What is a Woman? But we have all this content out there. And people will say, well, you have to put it out for free. Your Dr. Fauci documentary, you've got to put it out for free because it's so important that I say, okay, I can put it out for free. And then there's no more content. Yeah. You have to support it. You, ha you yeah. have to put your money where your mouth is. I do it. We, I, you know, luckily they give me a free subscription to Daily Wire, but I do it with plenty of other organizations. Very kind of them. Yeah, you know, I, I, I had to <laughs> negotiate it though. Yeah, <laughs> I, but I support those organizations where I want to see more yeah. of this. And so far, the business model of conservatism, especially in the culture, has worked, and it's worked beyond most people's wildest imaginations. Mm -hmm. And so. Hand over that mammon, please. You don't even need the mammon, by the way. You know, give to Caesar what is Caesar. Give to God what is God's. And give to Jeremy what is Jeremy's. Very good. Very good. <laughs> well, brother, thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure. Pleasure is mine. I, I want to go for like six hours. I because know. I know Seamus Coughlin, he, what did he do? Five hours? I think it was just over four. Maybe four and a, four four and a okay, half. So it was joy, <laughs> please. It was George, George that was did, five what, 17 and what? hours or something? 17 yeah. hours, oh. exactly, I think. That's brutal. And I'm like a little boy here. What have, we've only done what like we'll two. What we'll have to do is we'll have to, we'll have to fly down with our equipment to Nashville and sit in George's uh, that sounds cigar good, yeah. man cave. and we'll have a week-long show. Try, try to do a week-long show, yeah. <laughs> we, we each take naps <laughs> <laughs> one at a time. 
All right, pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.